Good evening. This lecture will be Lerefuat Rina Ora Batela Esther from Australia. Hopefully, success with the surgery. Uh, also, that's Lachat Arik Lev Ben Tikva. Lachat Mishpat. Also, Lerefuat Erez Ben Sara Mizrahi. Yesterday, Baruch mm-hmm. Hashem, in Queens, we spoke a lot about current events and the parasha. You know, we just read a few ideas. We stop in the middle of the action. We will continue today. Uh, people are asking me in the last few days, what should we do? The situation is terrible in America and it's terrible in Israel. What is the point to run from one place to another when both of them are insecure, the place are not secure? The life of the Jews here in New York and in the rest of the world is very not safe, as you can see. The world is full of Muslims. Many of them are murderers. It's not a secret, unfortunately. Not all of them. Some of them are nice people, but we have no way to know who is nice and who is not. You live in Israel among Arabs. Some of them could be nice people. The next one, right next to him, is a thirsty murderer. So it's very difficult to raise children in a building that any second you can get a knife to your throat. We just happened to someone yesterday. There's a video running on WhatsApp that the knife is still stuck in his back. The knife is still stuck. They have to wait for the ambulance to come. They're afraid to take it out, that he won't die. Nobody was... Terrible, shocking. So it's a problem. It's a problem. And uh, you have the same problem here, you have the same problem there. Hussein Obama, as I already said many times in my lectures, the damage that he made to this country, it will take a million years to fix. He basically officially destroyed America. He brought hundreds of thousands of immigrants here that some of them have Al-Qaeda and ISIS ideology, brought them in by massive amounts. Brooklyn is full of hundreds of thousands. And uh, unfortunately, they hate us. They hate the Jews. It's nothing new. It's, it's been going on for <laughs> over a thousand years. And we have to live here, and you never know what they can do. They attacked few synagogues. They threat, they make all kinds of anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic uh, uh, comments and violence. And in Israel, the same thing. So what are you going to do? Run to Australia? Run to New Zealand? Where are you going to run to? So what do we understand from it? What do we understand from it? That HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is actually telling you, you think you can run away from me? Keep dreaming. I'll make sure that the children of Ishmael, that the Torah say of wild beast, the words of God, not me. It's in written in the Torah, and it's interesting because the Muslims also admit it's the word of God. So there's no argument about that. Even in the Quran they talk about it. God say Ishmael is a wild beast. That's what else do you want? Pere Adam, wild beast. Pere means a wild person that cannot be controlled just like an animal. Same thing, you cannot control a lion or a tiger or, or a wild dog or a wild horse. You can't control them or an ox. These animals, you can't control them. This is what's going to be from this Ishmael and his descendants. And Hashem made sure that they will be scattered also all over the world, just like the Jews. They are scattered mostly by choice, not by force. They just get up and leave. They come to America. They live in Syria. They don't like it. They come here. They live in Egypt. They don't like it. They come here. They lived in Iraq. They come here. You know, we unfortunately, throughout the generation, were living in exile by force. We were kicked out of Israel. We went to Babylon and, you know, and the Romans. All these exiles that we had 
forced us to be scattered around the world and Hashem made sure that every place we will establish the community, they will come right next door to us. And the way Hashem did it is by making in their religion a law that they have to eat halal meat, which is a cheap imitation of kosher food. The Torah say, how, what meat you're allowed to eat. They give you a law how to slaughter the animal, what knife, where, check the animal from inside. You have a lot of oral laws. They don't have oral Torah. They only read in the Torah that Jews don't eat dead animals unless they are slaughtered. So they copied us as much as they could. So now in order for them to get meat, they can get kosher meat because it was slaughtered. Meat is also halal. Halal is not kosher. This is the way Hashem made them come automatically to live next door to us. And it's unbelievable because when they live next to you, they also have the opportunity to see you every day. And what happens when you have a mouse close to a cat every day? It drives the cat crazy. What happens if a cat is next to a dog all day? It drives the dog crazy, right? What happens if a mouse is next to a snake all day? It drives the snake crazy. What happens when Jews are close to Arab? It drives them crazy. That's it. They can't take it. And right away, they attack us and shoot us and kill us and burn our synagogues, unfortunately. It's very sad. Very sad situation. And again, it's, it doesn't need to be all. It's enough that it will be 1% and that's all. That's all you need, 1% that hate us, that they are violent. 1% from 1.8 billion. You do the math, how many? So, well, so what should we do? The answer is there is no place to run. If you would like to run to Israel because you're afraid of antisemitism in America, there is massive antisemitism in Israel by Arabs and by liberal Jews, lefty which are a million times worse than the Arabs. You should know the truth. The bigger enemy between the Arabs and the lefties are the lefties are much worse, much worse. They are controlling the court, they're passing the laws, they are destroying the government, they control the media, they push homosexuality on our children, they push horrible, not modest things in the world everywhere they go. And they destroy the world, not just Israel. They destroy the whole world, these lefties. Look what they did here in America, you can see. So that's what it is. If these lefties would live in the time of the Holocaust, they would write in Israel today in the newspaper, Israelis, I mean Jews, were brutally attacking their Nazis on the way of trying to escape from Auschwitz. That's the headlines they would write. Make no mistake. When they already killed millions of Jews, if one or five or ten or fifty Jews would uh, push the Nazi or break their head with some rock or rock and try to escape and save their life, the headlines will not be Nazis were trying to murder Jews and they managed to escape. That won't be the headline. The headline would be the Jews attack the Germans brutally on the way coming out of Auschwitz. Shame on you. That would be the headlines. And who would write these headlines? The lefty Jews of the social media of today. That's what's going on. So who is a bigger enemy? They are the biggest enemy. And I think that the only way to get rid of them is, really, that all the religious people in Israel will get really united, which unfortunately looks like an impossible mission, and will all come around the Supreme Court in Jerusalem with million torches and signs and stand there for a week from morning to night, learn there, retailim there, learn Gemara there, sit on the street, black the whole Jerusalem with million religious people and scream from morning to night and refuse to leave the place until all these judges will go to hell. 
and not leave the place until they get vanished from our face. We don't want to ever look at them. These Nazi judges, that all they want is to destroy Judaism and destroy the Torah. That's all they care about. Until it will happen, we will continue to suffer from them. That's it. Hashem is looking for Pinchas now. He's looking for Nachshon. If Nachshon would not enter the water, we would never come out of Mitzrayim. We wouldn't be here today. He walked into the water. Whatever happened, happened. We got to listen to Hashem and count on him. And Hashem made a miracle. Uh, Pinchas saw that so many people are dying. He got up and did what he had to do. The plague finished on a spot. Thousands of people were dying. Pinchas did an act of a hero. And Hashem immediately stopped killing people. There is one infidel, one of the list. You know, my, my list unfortunately grew from 14 to 16 dangerous infidels, heretic. People that speak, some of them even write books with the chutzpah, the nerve they have to write books. That they are destroying the world, these uh, this, uh, horrible uh, speakers among our communities. One of them is a big infidel that Gdole Ador already published a letter against him that is in a band. No one is allowed to buy his books. But he continued to sell books and he continued to write and just wrote another book. And he's uh, completely crazy with his lefty mind and corrupted mind and liberal mind. The damage the university is made to these 16 fools is beyond words. And he wrote now another, he wrote 16. One six, one six. And he wrote a book now and he say, because his book was written in a time of Corona, Look how they fool people. Listen, I just give you an example. I just found out about it. Someone just sent me an email about it, showing me a part from his book. So he said, this is what he says. He said, to say that reward and punishment is a must thing by Hashem, it's incorrect. What do you have to say? Rather, you have to say that Corona is the consequences of ignoring the rules of Hashem. Okay. Now you tell me what's the difference between this and that. They're so allergic to the word punishment, they cannot stand the word punishment because it's such a liberal society and so rotten. Okay. Free world, freedom. Everybody wants to be free from God, free from obligations, free from moral ethics, free from all, from all kinds of things that they don't like to do. So they hate this word so much, reward and punishment. So they put it in a laundry and this, uh, that's what comes out. It's dealing with the consequences of ignoring the rules of God. And what exactly that means? <sighs> it makes me sick to look at their face. I don't look at their faces, Baruch Hashem, because you're not allowed to look at the face of Rasha. You look at the face of a rasha, it makes you a serious damage to your soul, even in a picture. You can't look at their faces. So it is what it is. That's, a, that's what we have to deal with. We have enemies from all directions. If you think the Arabs are our main enemies, they're not even on the top three. The, the Israeli Supreme Court is the biggest enemy of the Jewish nation in a history, not just today in the history of the world. No one made more damage to the Torah in the last 50, 60 years than them. They destroyed Israel. They made Israel a state of gays. They made Israel a lefty liberal state. They destroyed all the morality. They destroyed everything you can imagine. The damage they made to Israel, it would take in another place 4,000 years what they did in 40 years. Just yesterday they passed a law that the, the government means nothing. We make the rules and we will cancel every rule and even the constitution. We can cancel and change as much as we want. Basically we, we declare, we, take, we took over Israel. Until now we interfere with votes and things that the government made. Meaning we don't care that 80% of the Israeli wants this rule. We will tell them what to do, what to do. We, the nine filthy judges, we will tell them what to do. 
That's it. That's what's happening now. And believe me, this can be over in one day. All we need is one day of unity. If the Arabs were united, we will all be dead. All we needed, we don't need it. All the Arab need is to be united for one day. Now, you know what? Not even one day. Eight hours. If all Arabs in the world will be united for one day, it will be the end of all of us. All they have to do is to walk to Israel. That's it. One billion Arabs will walk to Israel with flag. Peace. We want peace. We came to hug the Jews. That's it. But they can't because the Egyptians against the Hamas. And the Hamas against the Abu Mazen. And Abu Mazen is against this. And Jordan is against that. And uh, Iraq is against Iran. And Iran is against Saudi. And Saudi is against... Everybody is against everyone. Sunni, Shiite. They all between themselves kill each other. If they would all leave each other alone, Sunni, Shiite, this, all kinds of uh, Al-Qaeda and IC, you don't know who is against who. It's very difficult to follow. You hear that they put a bomb here and kill 30 people in a mosque. Why an Arab put a bomb in a mosque and kill 40 Muslims? Why? Because one is Shiite and one is Sunni. What, do you, what is going on here? So, thanks to this, that hatred among themselves, it gives us a little bit of air to breathe. But they are not our main enemy. The main enemy is from our own nation. That's what the, 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 the Torah says. You understand? So, here it is. So w when you ask what should we do, the answer is when you do not know what to do, what does the Torah say? Tshuva. Huh? Tshuva. Tshuva you have to do every day. Tshuva you have to do even when things is paradise. You have to do tshuva. But what I'm saying to you is, when the Torah say you have an intersection, you have to make a left or a right, you don't know. What do you do? You stay still. Pause. I don't know what to do. Should I move? Who promises it's going to be better? I don't know. Should I stay? Do I know what to do? I don't know what to do. There's no way to know right now. So really what, what's left is to do tshuva, to become righteous. Not to blame the Arabs, and not to blame the Nazis, and not to blame anybody. To blame ourselves. We have to do tshuva. We have to be righteous in the eyes of God, that's it. And remember, we get angry at the Arabs, but if we really be righteous, we would have no problem with them whatsoever. Nothing. You would see him say, thank you for killing me. Because if God decided for you to kill me, that means I deserve it. And if he decided you're going to burn the synagogue, this synagogue and not this one, that means something in that synagogue caused that synagogue to be burned. And if this person got shot off, check in all his reincarnation why God made Ahmed shoot him. It wouldn't be Ahmed, it would be a lion. It would be a lion, it would be who knows what, a car that hit him. I know it's hard to hear such thing because we like to blame someone. i give you an example. If you hear that an accident happened and two Jews, husband and wife, got hit by a truck and died, it makes you sad but not angry. But if you hear an Arab shot them and make you sad and furious, why? I don't understand. What's the difference how they died? Two people died because on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem wrote, that they have to, uh, wrote in his book that they have to die. Two people. Does it make a difference if they got hit by a truck or by a lightning or an Arab went and shot them? Does it make a difference? No. Why when the Arab shot them it makes us angry? Ego. Ego. What, you're putting us down? We lose the war? It's all ego. It should now make a difference. We have to be sad and upset that people are dying young and tragedies are happening to us. And now in Italy yesterday, a uh, cable train fell. Five Israelis died, a husband and wife and a kid and a grandfather and a grandmother all died in Italy. And a few days earlier, two people died in Stalin. Erev Chag Shavuot, Shavuot's evening, Yom Tov began. 
the whole place collapsed. 160 people got injured, some seriously, and two people died. And a few days earlier, 45 righteous people in Meron died. And a few months before that, we had 14 months of dying from Corona. And who knows what's next? <coughs> this has to wake us up to look at the world from a different point of view. We have to understand there is a major judgment on the world and the main judgment is against the Jewish nation. Because everything that happens in the world, the Gemara say, happened for the nation of Israel. And if there is anger by God against the Jewish people, the mm -hmm. anger among the Jewish people is mainly, mainly at the religious Jews. Because the non-religious Jews have no idea whatsoever what they came to the world for. Ask 90% of the Jews in the world, the non-religious, what's the purpose of life? None of them knows. None of them knows. Not only that, if you come to the Gentiles, Christians, Arabs, Hindus, Buddhists, you tell them who are considered to be the chosen people of God. Everybody will tell you the Jews. It's written in a Hamas declaration. Sheikh Ahmed Yassin say the Jews are the chosen people that were chosen by God and they betrayed him again and again and again and until they killed their own prophets, he's referring to Yeshaya, and betrayed God so many times, we, the Arabs, have to teach them a lesson. It's like Hashem speaking from his mouth. I don't even know if he was aware of what he's writing. That's exactly what the Torah said that will happen. Why the name of Ishmael is Ishmael, Ismail, the Gemara say, and the Zohar? Because he will give us so much problems that we all scream to God and he would listen to us finally. Ishmael. Ishma means would listen. The Arab, Arab language is very similar to Hebrew. A lot of the words there were taken from, his, from Hebrew, from the Torah. Like Ishmael, Ismail. Right? What does it mean? Esma. It's Esma Yaibni. Shma Bni. It's imitation. So many words, thousands of words. Imitation of Hebrew are taken from the Torah. Remember, Muhammad is 2,000 years after the Torah, 1,900 years after. Whatever he saw in the Torah, they adapted to their language. So, why their name is Ishmael? Because they give us so much hard time before the Messiah will come, that will scream to Hashem, and finally, thanks to that suffering and screaming, he would listen to us and a miracle will happen. That's why their name is Ishmael. Why would you call a, a person God would hear, God would listen? Why? Because it's already prepared for the days that the Arabs will torture us before the end, as it's written in the Torah, it's, it's written. Don't forget, when the Zohar wrote it 2,000 years ago, the Arabs were living in a desert like Bedouin. They didn't have any country, not Kuwait, not Bahrain, not Egypt. Egypt was the Egyptians of Pharaoh, they were not Arabs. There was no Jordan, there was no Iraq. Iraq was Babylon, it was a different nation. It was not Arab. All the Arab countries that you see today, none of them existed in the time of Hazal. There was no Islam yet. Later, they started to occupy places, to live in certain places and make it a country. But when this prophecy was written, there were worthless people that lived in the desert and nobody even cared they existed in the world. They didn't have any civilization, no nothing. All of a sudden, today, 2,000 years later, you see the words of the Gemara happen exactly against all odds. So what do you see over here? That's 1,000% the hand of Hashem. So why are you angry at them? And don't forget, whenever an Arab kill a Jew, what's the first thing he scream? Always. Allah Akbar, God is great. Who is screaming from his mouth? Hashem. Remember, you are dying because of your sins. Where is it written? Parashat Bechukotai. It's written in Parashat Bechukotai. 
because of those sins you are going to die. It's written, it's a clear verse in the Torah. Sins kills. Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa in the Gemara, there was a snake coming from the ground, a rod. People were afraid to go in that area. He said, where, where is it? He said, Rabbi, somewhere around there. He went to look for the hole. And when he saw the hole, he put his ankle over there. And the snake came and beat him and nothing happened. So, Rabbi, it's life risk. What are you doing? I wanted to teach you a lesson. The snake does not kill. The sin kill. The Arabs do not kill. The sins kill. The Nazis do not kill. The sin kills. Everybody that kills in the end needed the approval of God. If you did not deserve to die, he can shoot at you 5,000 bullets. None of them would hit. And if you deserve to die, even if he's blind and he didn't see you, somebody else would see you. If you don't understand this concept, you cannot call yourself a religious Jew. It's about time people will already wake up with their nonsense. Everything that happens to us, it's a punishment. Or like this idiot in his book say, the consequences of ignoring the word of God. Either way, it's the same thing. You will ignore me, you'll pay the price. So now I'm asking you, do we want to learn the easy way or we want to learn the hard way? That's the question. I heard a story an hour ago. I wish Simantov was here to testify because he stood next to me when the guy told us the story, right here in King's Highway. We were walking here and someone hung from his pickup truck. He saw me, five years I didn't see that guy. Israeli guy, five years. Rabbi, I'm looking for you for years. Oh, Baruch Hashem. We begin to talk on the street. He told me, I, why are you looking for me? I have a story to tell you that you will never, ever believe such a thing. I say yes. He said, I had, I was in Israeli special unit, SEALs. SEALs, Shayetet. We dived in a Yarkon and that has some, some kinds of chemical there that made all those soldiers get cancer. Almost all of them got cancer. They sued the Israeli state, they refused to give them money, some of them died. He found out, I don't remember if he said two years ago or whatever, shortly, he found out he has cancer, serious cancer that the doctor that found it told him you have 21 days maximum to live. 21 days. So he said, Tov, I have, I have nothing, what else, what do I have to live for? He does not marry the guy. So I'll live my last 20 days, what can I do? So I live my last 20 days. So he, he said, I went to a restaurant. He went to a restaurant. He see a Chinese guy with a tie. You can see a respectable Chinese guy, Chinese American. Ate in a fancy restaurant. And now when he was about to pay, he found out that someone stole his wallet. I'm so sorry, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't have my wallet. They hand them the bill. And he was there, this guy, this Israeli guy. Now remember, he already gave up on life. So what is he gonna do with the money he has? He has no family. <laughs> so he said to him, what's the problem? He said, I, I, I'm so embarrassed. I have a, a, to pay the check and I just found out someone stole my wallet. So, he said, how much is the bill? He said, wow, it's $300, don't worry, I'll pay it. Wow, I can't thank you enough, can I get your number? I'll call you tomorrow, I'll give you back the money. It's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> he doesn't know that he's so generous because he's about to die. <laughs> so, he gives him the, he gives him the, the, the money, he pays for the bill. The next day the Chinese guy calls. He's American Chinese. Say to him, where can I see you to, this guy has a, a restaurant in Manhattan. 
So he said, where can I, uh, where can I see you to give you? He said to him, don't worry about it, sir. Anyway, I don't have that much to live. I just found out I have 20 days to live. What will I do with the $300 you give me? You can keep it, it's okay. So the guy said to him, how exactly are you going to die? He said to him, I have serious cancer. He said to him, what, can you send me the information? Do you have it on disk, whatever? He said, why should I send it to you? He said, I work in uh, Sloan Catering here in Manhattan. <laughs> I'm a doctor for cancer. But he's not telling him that he's the best doctor in the world yet. He doesn't tell him that yet. Send me the disc. He sent him the disc. He said, I want you to come to the hospital in five minutes. Can you do it? I'm on my way. He comes to the hospital. There was someone big shot there, supposedly he's the owner of the hospital, or one of the owners, I don't know what. And he said to him, uh, we have to operate on this guy today, not tomorrow. What, well, today? It's not in the schedule. Whatever the conversation is, he said, today we're going to make the surgery. He picked up his shirt. Everything is cut. The whole, it's all stuff. scary. It's all stuff and all kinds of holes. <laughs> we almost fainted. We saw that. He said they made a surgery and saved his life. That was you know, a while ago. Now listen, the guy is not religious. He's walking without kippah. He said, I had a restaurant in Manhattan, not kosher, 52nd Street. Got burned. Got burned. How many more signs a person needs from Hashem to wake up? He's about to die. Lost his business. And I asked him, no, he's still not Shomer Shabbat? You're not going to keep Shabbat? I put fill in. <laughs> Thank you very much, you put fill in. This is the story of our life. No matter how much we owe God, we just fail to, fail to fulfill our obligation. The Gemara say one of the rabbis, daughter used, uh, he used to make him some hair, you know, with the, what do you call it? No, with the hand, yeah, like she has like, you know, like the Chinese have this, what do you call it? A fin? A fan, a fan, a fan like a fan. Yeah. All right, a fan. F-A-N. F-A-N, okay. So she goes like this, and she make him some hair. She make him some hair. And uh, after, uh, every time she used to make him some hair, because it was hot and humid, you know, in Israel it's very hot and humid. So he used to squeeze some nice leaves, like, with good smell, like jasmine or something, and give her perfume. That was the perfume of the women in those days. Orange blossom, jasmine, you know, lemon, all kinds of things like that. So one time it was a nice breeze. Wow, nice cool breeze came. And he said to his daughter, you're giving me a little air with this fan. I have to spend an hour and squeeze for you flowers. How much I have to squeeze now just for this wave of, of, of air that I got from Hashem. <laughs> you understand, Rabotai? So, let's move on. So yesterday we, f- we finished with the words of Rav Yonatan Eifschitz about uh, someone that is not rebuking the public. You see someone speaks in the middle of a Kaddish, speaking in the middle of reading the Torah, and you don't say anything because you think he may get upset at me. Why should I push my nose to other people's business? A big mistake. Conclusion of his words that sinat chinam, baseless hatred, is not rebuking people that you know that are doing something wrong and you can stop it and because of personal reasons you're embarrassed you don't want him to be upset you you know you don't you're afraid what people will think about you because of selfish reasons you are not 
you are not rebuking him. On my way here, someone uh, left me a recording on WhatsApp. I heard you say in your lecture that if someone does not share your lectures, you're not allowed them to watch the lectures. So I am sharing your lectures, but not in all my groups. I have some groups that I can share your lectures, and I have some groups that it may not be a good idea to share the, the lectures over there. Probably a lot of lefties there and this. <laughs> so, am I Yotze? Meaning, did I fulfill my obligation? What would you answer him? I mean, yeah. Huh? So I told him, you don't have to do it to be just yoitze. <laughs> to, okay, I fulfilled my obligation, so leave me alone. No, 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 that's not the right approach. You have to do it because that's the right thing to do. You have to spread the word of God to as many people. Whether they like to hear it, whether they don't like to hear it. If they don't like to hear it, it's not my problem. I brought to you wisdom of God to listen to, things that are written in the Torah. Maybe you will become a better human being, maybe you'll be more generous, maybe you'll help the poor, maybe you'll stop stealing, maybe you'll stop speaking bad about uh, all kinds of your friends, maybe you, know, you will improve all your bad ways. Maybe yes, maybe not. That's not in my hand anymore. I gave you the food. Would you eat or not? It's up to you. My question is, do I do it because I want to just save myself from the obligation? No, I have to do it because it's the right thing to do. That's what I answered him. So you're right. That's the way I should think. And if people will bark, I told him, let them bark. The dogs are barking. And you still walk in the street, even if they bark. You are offended from a dog that barks at you? You walk here in Coney Island, next to these private homes. And one of the dogs will scream and jump on the fence, wants to kill you. Bark, bark, all day. Do you care? You look at him with a smile and you continue to walk. Anyone is insulted because a dog barked at him? Raise his hand. Baruch Hashem, you're all normal. If a person will come to me and say, I'm so insulted, why? My neighbor has a dog. Every time he sees me, he's bark. He's a racist, this dog. I don't know, he doesn't like black people, he doesn't like white people, he doesn't like Chinese people, he doesn't like Jews. I don't know, he doesn't understand my dog. I don't know. What's going on over here? The answer is, you need a psychiatrist. <laughs> if, if, a dog bar bothers you. What, what else can we say? So let's move on. In Mechaya Ametim, that's where I finished yesterday. In the blessing of Baruch Atah Hashem Mechaya Ametim, bless you God, reviving the, the dead. There, the angels are announcing to Hashem then every day the names of all the people that rebuke the public. Mochichim, this guy, that guy, this rabbi, this Jew, doesn't have to be a rabbi. I told you, today to rebuke people, all you have to do is to hand them a CD. USB, book, CD, USB, book, that's it. You don't, you don't have to give them a speech now. You meet someone on a train, you have a conversation, you see he's an infidel. He says, I'm an atheist. Ta-ta-ta-ta, Torah and science. Here is my gift to you. Can spare a dollar to save someone's soul? You should always have a bunch. Here, watch this film. In my opinion, not because it's my film. It's my film, but the people that really work very hard to do it is Nisim from J Root Radio in Iran. We used to work with him at that time. Like, I don't know, what, when was that, 15 years ago? They did all the job voluntarily. That's their schut. Tens of thousands of Baalei Tshuva came from that field. They have a share in all of, each one of them. In their studio here in Brooklyn. Since nobody cared about money or anything like that, I came, I spoke four hours straight in the studio. 
And they did whatever they did and made it nice. And Baruch Hashem, it saved so many people. Everyone who watched, it, watched that film, it changed his entire life. It's translated to nine languages. It's the best film ever made in a history to prove, A, that God exists, Two, that all religions are all fake beside Judaism. It leaves no doubt after you watch it. Doesn't matter what you are, an Arab, a Christian, doesn't matter. Once you watch it, if you have brain, you know immediately that every other religion who came after Judaism are all fake. They're full of human errors. I showed the human errors over there, which you know God did not write these books. So now you know, you have to focus on the original one. We are the only nation that got the Torah in a public event in front of millions of people. Every other religion is a story of one person, which no witness ever saw that God spoke to him or an angel. It's his story. So right away, all religions start with 50% doubt. And the Torah is the only religion that millions of people heard Moses and God speaking in front of the whole audience. And our Torah is the only book that the people that receive it are written in the book. Meaning, I'm receiving now the book after I saw God speaking to Moshe, and I see that I'm in the book. The book is cl claiming that I heard the voice of God. So if I read it, that means it had to happen. No one will give me a book, say, all of you heard me speaking to God if I did not hear the, vo the word of God. Muhammad did not come to the Muslims and say, all of you heard me speaking to God. Because nobody saw it. He claimed he was alone. Mary had a dream. God came to me in a dream and made me pregnant. How many people saw it? Nobody, of course. Nobody can witness a dream. Right? Buddha saw the light. How many people saw it with him? Nobody. And so forth and so on. The only religion that was given in a public event is the Torah. That's already enough for someone clever to understand there is the diamond and all the cubic zirconia right there. So, next thing it proves is not only the written Torah is divine, all the oral things that are written in the Talmud are also divine. There's divine knowledge. No human being was able to know these things about the creation, about the future, about the galaxies. We didn't have the technology of today. So you see right away that this is the book of God, the written and the oral. And the third part of the film is all the famous questions that everybody asks every day. Do we have life after death? There is reincarnation. What's the purpose of life? What does it mean, Shabbat? Lots of questions. Why righteous people suffer and wicked people celebrate? All kinds of things like that. So, as results of that, as results of that, you know, people that watch it, they change their entire life. So what makes you not hand it to them? You should walk every day and see people, excuse me, can I give you a gift? Ten of them you gave, one of them watched it. So for ten dollars you saved the soul. And you give another 10, and another one watched. And you give another 10, and another one watched. Some minimum one. Sometimes you get lucky. All, all 10 will watch, or 8 will watch. That's already not in your hand. But that's called to rebuke the people. I'm rebuking you. You live in a lie. So I'm helping you out to see the truth. Let's move on. So... The Torah, the parasha began with the ish et kodashav lo iyu. You bring a sacrifice to Hashem, it's holy, right? Kodashav. Lo iyu. How can it be yours after you give it to the Kohen? If I'm giving you this bottle of water, one of you, here, take it. You're drinking it. Is it mine or yours? It's not mine anymore. I can declare as much as I want that it's mine, but everybody knows it's left my hand that someone else has it. Either he burned it or ate it or sacrificed it, whatever the case is. What does the Torah mean? Whatever you give to the Kohen, it's yours. It means it's yours for eternity. Every charity you give a poor person, you take with you to the next world. Every kindness, act of kindness, you take with you. 
Everything you taught other people, the word of God, you take with you. What you're trying to keep, it's not yours. What you give to others, it's yours. The opposite of what people think. People think the more I'm going to hide here and in Switzerland and under the ground and this and that and that, it's mine. What I give, okay, goodbye. Here, take a hundred bucks. Thank you. No, 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 my friend. You're, you're thinking wrong. It's exactly the opposite. So, the holy rabbi from Apta, Aurev Israel me Apta, that was his name. He had a lot of love to the Jews around him. In his famous book, Yalkut Oev Israel, and he said, this verse is teaching us one important thing. There is an agreement in Judaism, it's called Issachar and Zvulun. There are two brothers, the, the, brother, the, the, the sons of Jacob, Issachar and Zvulun. Issachar learns Torah, and Zvulun is a businessman, import, export, boats. Zvulun said to his brother, you sit and learn the word of God, I'm going to take care of all your financial need. You don't have to worry. Whatever your expenses, give me all the bills, I pay them. I give you money, food, rent, mortgage, whatever the mortgage is. It may be thousands of dollars in today's life, right? So if a couple get married, let's see, they don't have kids yet. They need to pay rent about 1500 to 2000 Food and, and, and all kinds of miscellaneous is at least another thousand. If they lease a, a simple car with insurance, they need about 35, 3,600 to live in New York. In Israel, less, maybe 2,000, you know, it's a little bit less than here. But if this businessman is willing to do it, let's see, he's a millionaire. What's for him, three, 4,000 a month? He gives it to this couple. He learns all man Torah. All the Torah he learned goes to him and to him. It's duplication. Issachar gets it, and Zvulun gets it. Now let's do the math. In an average day, every hour you learn is 60,000 mitzvot. Every Bachur Yeshiva learns about 10 hours a day. Some learns 12, some 14, some 16. I have my cousin, the tzaddik, the, the genius Chacham, at least 18 hours a day learns, at least. He can't leave the learning, barely sleeps. Motzei Shabbos, the Gemara is open, no matter, Chola <laughs> he doesn't have any breaks. His entire life is learning and focusing in holiness 100%, all the time. Someone that sponsors someone like that is a trillionaire, not billionaire. After he leaves the world, he's going to be in a top, top, top place in the next world in heaven. Why all his holy Torah, he doesn't have internet, he doesn't have a phone, he doesn't have computer. He has a family, he has a lot of kids, probably $3,000. But I'm just saying that anyone that is, became a partner with someone like this holy, you come to the next world with your poor knowledge of Torah. And all of a sudden you find out that you have Torah more than anyone you know, more than rabbis and more than, <laughs> because you supported him, he's smart, you use your money instead of leasing a Bentley, say so I'll drive a Camry and the money that I would spend on a Bentley I'll give to the Chacham to live. What did the Bentley give you? Brought you faster to hell, <laughs> that's for sure. And now at least you're in a very, very VIP place in the next world. This is just an example. By the way, when Jacob gave blessing to his sons, who did he bless first? Issachar and Zvulun. You have a boy that learns all day Torah, and you have a businessman. The businessman wear a pink shirt, gray jacket, nice jeans with cowboy boots. Baruch Hashem, he takes his keep out of his pocket when he makes Birkat Amazon, but he's generous. He sponsored the Chacham and his family all month. You look at the Ben Torah and you look at this businessman. What's to compare? This is a holy man and this is Baruch Hashem, a good person, that's it. Yaakov gave Zvulun the blessing before he gave to Issachar. Before. Not only that, 
It's very interesting. Moshe also gave the blessing to Zvulun before Issachar. Twice, not random. What do you see? That is Zvulun is even greater than actual Issachar. So let's see what he has to say. So in the verse in front of us, we have the hint to the answer about Issachar and Zvulun. The question is, how is Sachar agree to give up on half of his reward? Just for a few thousand dollars a month. One word of Torah worth trillions. One word. Are you willing to give up your whole month of Torah for 50% off? Half of your reward? That's a very big question. When he supports you in this world for 10, 20, 30 years, and it's over like a blink of the eye. And he's going to benefit from it for eternity. Much more than 20, 30 years in the next world. So what kind of a business is that? You give me 30 years help. And I give you life of eternity in the best place. That's not a fair partnership. If two partners go into open a restaurant and they need a million dollars. If one gives 990,000 and the other one gives 10,000, that's a fair partnership? Something doesn't end up. How can it be? As it's written in the book of Yeshaya, chapter 64, verse 3, <laughs> There are certain people that can reach a level of seeing God in his full glory like nobody else can give, can see. The answer is, Rabotai, Issachar does not lose anything from his reward, just like a candle. When you take from one candle to light another candle, this candle lost anything? Bring a thousand candles and take from me fire, free! It does not decrease anything from my level. Take as much as fire as you take. If you take water from this bottle, everyone takes a glass, three, three cups of water, and there's no water. I left with nothing. But if you take fire from my match, take more, more, more. Thousand people took more and more and more. There's no problem. It does not decrease even a bit from a fire. Same thing, Torah. You can never lose by teaching other people Torah. You think I'm wasting my time. The two hours I'm sitting here now, I could have sit in my room with my stand there, enjoy, learn new things. Two extra hours of learning of new interesting things. Not to repeat the same thing for the thousand time. Not to talk about the traffic and the way. That's a logical thinking. But the Torah is the real logic, because it's the logic of God. So when your logic contradicts the logic of God, eliminate your logic and focus to the real logic. Nobody can ever lose by doing the will of God. Nobody ever lost for doing something that makes Hashem happy. If you think that by you sacrificing to do what God wants you to do, right? Then you are an infidel. If you think you go and do something, you help the poor, you help the widow, you help the orphan, you come and set up the chairs or you clean the shul after everyone leave, instead of running to your business or anything like that, or you give someone a ride or you go out of your way, all these things that people do, if you think by that a lost will come to you, you are an infidel. An infidel means someone that contradicts what's written in the book of God. That's an infidel. Heretic, meaning God says yes and he says no. God says allowed, he says not allowed, or the other way around. So we have to stick to what's written in the book. For instance, the Torah says you should not kill. What does it mean? This is a laws for Jews and for Gentiles. We're not allowed to kill people, even if you don't like their face, even if you don't like their accent, even if you don't like their clothes, even if you don't like that they're very stupid. 
You're not allowed to kill. Huh? Jews cannot kill Gentiles. Gentiles cannot kill Jews. People that think that by killing Jews they do the will of God, nobody is dumber than them in the world. How do you think in the world that the Torah says that my children are the nation of Israel and by you killing them, you're going to get a reward for it? Where is your head? You have no end to your hell. It will never end. Because the Torah says in so many places, by the way, it's even written in the Quran. Even in the Quran, it's written about the Jewish people. It's very interesting. So, the question is like this. In a book, Smach Zvulun, is talking about the special reward of Zvulun for giving. What does it, what does it mean? Let's see. The Maharsha. You heard about the Maharsha? How many years ago the Maharsha lived? Who knows? 450 years ago. The Maharsha wanted to open a yeshiva. The Maharsha wants to open a yeshiva in his town. Why? Because the old yeshiva was very old and small. There was no room for all the students. So they made now an auction, <coughs> fundraising, an auction. It's called Even Apina. Who's going to put the first brick in the building? They sell it. Who's going to pay for Aron Kodesh? Who's going to pay for the Bima? Who's going to pay for the bathroom? <laughs> Everybody has to pay for something. So they auction it. The people of the community and all the rabbis of the town, they all came to the front of the shul where they're supposed to build it. And the gabai stood on a chair and say, everyone who wants to make an offer, please offer. First brick of the building, 1,000, 5,000 rubles, 10,000 rubles. Everyone who raised the, 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 the price, the Gabai immediately add another thousand to it. Nobody understand. Like imagine, you know how sometimes you go to a place and you have the one who sells the aliot, and he says, and he said, 10,000, and you say 11, and right away the Gabai, be, without even checking, 11,500, 12, 13, 15, 20. <laughs> what is going on? Some places, they do it when the person that beat is Mechalel Shabbat. <laughs> you cannot give him Aliyah. Mechalel Shabbat, Areu ki goy lechol davar. So they already know that since you cannot give this person Aliyah, no matter how much he wants to give, you beat on top of him, the Gabai. Not that the Gabai will have to pay it. But that's the way of not insulting the guy by telling him, I'm sorry, you cannot buy it. Some places, they just don't, they're not embarrassed. Someone will come and whisper in his ear, excuse me, you cannot buy aliot here. So you choose which way you want to do it. Did you ever see Hasidi Shul that the Mechal and Shabbos get aliyah? Go to Vishnitz. 30 years. Do you think one Mechal and Shabbat ever went up to the Torah? Hidden, we don't know. I'm talking with his jeans and earring and gel. <laughs> he comes, he showed up. Hi, who's the Gabai? Rav Mendel. Rav Mendel, who's Marste? My name is Itzik from Tel Aviv. <laughs> How much it would cost to get Aliyah? Itzik, you have nice coffee over there, some gefilte fish, chew lent. Go help yourself. Why? He cannot give him Aliyah. It's against the rules. Even if he likes, if he's his own son. <laughs> Mechalel Shabbat in private doesn't exist today. Let's start with that. Because all the Mechalel Shabbat today unfortunately lost the shame a long, long time ago. If there are people who break Shabbat hiddenly, it could be some religious kids that they're afraid that the parents will find out. Yes, there are things. We are not prophets. We see a guy with a yamaka, a guy with tzitzi, he looks religious, and we give him aliyah. We don't have to go and investigate for every person if he's Shomer Shabbat or no. 
usually a Shomer Shabbat, you can see by his look. Someone walks in the street with a yamaka, you expect him to be Shomer Shabbat, no? Let's, let's not be wise. <laughs> Let me ask a simple question. From every hundred people who walks in the street with a yamaka, how many of them are Michalel Shabbat? What do you think? Maybe one at worst case scenario, right? One out of a hundred? Mamor? You're dreaming. <laughs> you're dreaming, you're dreaming. Yeah. People do not walk with the yamaka if they are Michalel Shabbat. Uh, in private. in private, sometimes people don't know all the rules. They just don't know. Like someone, what if someone has the mother that I got and he's chanting on Shabbat? <laughs> <laughs> you really have people like that? Yeah. What, they have to check what their stocks did on Shabbat? The yeah. stock market is closed on Shabbat. Oh, the crypto. Ah, crypto. <laughs> crypto. <laughs> I, I thought that uh, Bitcoin will go down to $3,000. So far it looks that I'm wrong. <laughs> Why did I think it's going to go down to zero almost? Because now the IRS is on top of the people. That's it. Till now it was a party. Now every time you do a transaction, 10,000, they get a report. They will audit you that year for sure. And then they'll check everything else about you. So this crypto will bring to your end. Because if they begin to check about you, they already decide in advance how much they want to catch. Uh, they and the truth have no connection. At least that's how it is in Israel. In Israel, they come to Said Abu Lafia. You know him? Said Abu Lafia is the most famous bakery in the world. Said Abu Lafia in Jaffa. His bakery worked 24 7 around the clock. Now, one time you'll come there and you will see less than 50 people there waiting online. 24 7 for 40 years. It's, it's an empire of bakery. They sell sambusa, pizza on pita, all kinds of burekas, anything you can think of. I haven't seen the place 25 years. Now when I was in Israel, accidentally I made a mistake. All of a sudden the GPS took me and I see Said Abu Lafia. They expanded the place, became very big. There are people walking in now. It used to be on everyone on the street. Tov, Said Abu Lafia was actually a righteous Arab. Rav Horowitz, I think it was his name, came to him. He saw a lot of Jews buy chametz in Pesach in the... Uh, from Abu Lafia Bakery. He said to him, how much it would cost me to give you to close on Pesach? How much? He said to him, nah, I don't think, Rabbi, you can handle it. The price was one apartment for one week. Apartment in Israel, meaning every week his business make him a new apartment. Imagine how rich this guy is. So the rabbi said, I'll pay you the, the full price without question ask. Close from now on on Pesach. I'll pay you every time you come to me before the Pesach, I'll give you the money and you promise to close. I was very impressed, this Arab, by the rabbi. And he closed. And he paid him first year. Second year. By the third year, when the rabbi said, come take your money. He said, I'm not coming to take it. I saw the blessing of God for doing it. My business tripled. Wow. Keep the money, Rabbi. Every year I'll close in Pesach. Not only that, when I was now in Israel, I was invited to speak in a place that he donated. A yeshiva in Yafo, an Arab. He donated the land. He owned it. Right not far from his bakery. Take it. Make yourself a yeshiva. This guy already passed. He passed, I think he had a disease, he passed. Very rich man. He was so successful, the Israeli IRS told him, we cannot keep track on your business. It will take us years. <laughs> Let's agree on a fixed amount that you pay us every year and you can do whatever you want. 
They allowed him not to work with cash registers. In Israel, if you don't have a cash register, you get arrested on the spot. If a customer comes and you don't know his IRS agent, and he stands by the window and he orders a few things, and you have a cash register, but you did not type it in, they take out their batch, please move away from the register, he picks up the cash register, he kick everyone from the cell, close your place, they arrest you, like Gestapo, and the investigation begins. They check how many bags of flour you bought this year, everything, they look at all your bills. Basically, you finished. You beg them to take whatever they want just to leave you alone. So, with him, they say to him, how come you don't have cash register? He says, I can't, I have 50 people every minute, comes, new people come. If I'm going to start working on cash register, people would wait here for hours. Back and forth, they fought with him. In the end, they say, okay, let's see how much you made deposits in the last few years. We'll make an average. You pay us this amount. And finished. No register. I don't think there's a more successful baker in the whole world than him. It's very successful. So this is just an example of what's going on. So let's move on. So they now want to sell the first brick of opening the yeshiva of the Marsha. Whatever they bid, they got by Ed. In the end, in the end, nobody else bid, and the Gabai say, okay, and an anonymous person won the mitzvah. And everyone screamed, tell us who! <laughs> who gave so much money? He asked to stay anonymous. <laughs> Tov? Everyone, got, everybody in town talks about it now. Who is the guy? Do you know? Come on, you know. <laughs> you know how curious the Jews are. Come on, you know. Ah, come on, tell me. No, just tell me. I promise you I won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Beloni. So, he said, he said, no, I cannot tell. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So, when they now find, finally building the place, you know, you invite the person that donated. So they invited kids, they invited the uh, old people, and they, everybody asked, no, who is the person? They want to know who the person that donated the building. They got so disappointed to see the Maharsha himself come to put the first brick. They said, no, I wasn't the rabbi giving the money. Who is the man, rabbi? The rabbi say, I'm sorry, the sponsor asked to stay anonymous. Everybody went home disappointed. After that, the Maharsha himself got curious. He called the rabbi and he said to him, would you tell me the anonymous identity that I should go and tell him thank you in person? It's the minimum I can do. The Gabai said, I will go to the place of the person, ask his permission, and if he will agree, I will tell the Rav. The guy agreed, and the Marsha found out who the guy is. He was shocked. He never ever thought that this person is rich, an ordinary person. He came to thank him, and he said to him, Wow, I did not know you wealthy, Baruch Hashem. He said to him, I'm not wealthy. Not at all. This is money that I put aside for many years for one day to build the Beta Mikdash. So that's everything I have. I don't have anything else. I don't own anything, nothing. So I decided to do it because I'm already old and I don't have kids. And what's the point of keeping it? I one day will die. I have no, no children. Who's going to pray for me, for my soul, after I die? So the minimum I could do is to at least invest in this yeshiva. At least what's going to happen here will give me some benefit. <laughs> the Maharsha got very excited. And he said, I'm giving you a blessing that thanks to your gener generosity, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you a boy 
very soon. Less than a year later, this person has a baby, boy, after years he could not have any kids. The boy grew up. When he was 13, his father took him to the yeshiva of the Maharsha and asked if they can accept the boy to learn there. The problem with that yeshiva it was from 18 and up. It was past high school. Metzivta. So, you know, he said, this is, a, is this kid is, is for high school. He should not be over here. But uh, they say, I'm sorry, you cannot, it's too young. Come back in a few years. The father did not give up. He said, let me go to speak to the rabbi. Ah, the rabbi is a busy man. No, no, it's important. Please let me. He walked in. He said uh, to the rabbi, do you remember me? I am the person that the rabbi gave me a blessing after many years I did not have kids. This is the boy that was born from your bracha. He's your son. I want him to learn in your yeshiva. As soon as he remembers that he's the one who, thanks to him, they have this building, right the way he accepted him to the yeshiva and ordered two students to be responsible for him personally and teach him. Because they need to bring him to the level. What happened to that guy? Baruch Hashem. <laughs> He got all the mitzvot of the yeshiva of the Maharsha to his account. <laughs> and thanks to that, he got a kid. That's what it means, Rabotai, when I say to you what the Torah says, et kodashav lo truma. Khu means to take. Take donation. What do you mean take? Give donation. You don't give. It's all taking. You teach someone, you take. You give money to someone, you take. You help in a synagogue, you take. You clean the shul, you take. You take and put it in your saving accounts that will remain for eternity. And that's why we have to all remember every second of our life. Not only he got the merit, his son became a big Talmud Chacham. Thanks to that, he got a son. Next topic in the parasha was a woman that was not faithful to her husband. Today, women like this get a TV show. <laughs> they say to her, oh, wow, you're so open-minded. Wow, we're so impressed. In the time of the Torah, it was death penalty. Death penalty. By the Arabs, it's still death penalty. Some of the rules, the Arabs kids better, better than us. What's true, it's true. You cannot be a gay in the Arab country and walk hand with hand with your boyfriend and look at the, the caliph, the mola. What, what's his name? The, the one in the mask. Imam. imam. The imam in his face. Hi, uh, hi, imam. Hi, your honor. Two minutes later, you'll be stoned to death. It's one thing you make your sins in hidden room that we do not know of it. There's a second thing you have the chutzpah to come in our face with such a horrible scene and look at us and smile like, you're not gonna tell me what to do? <laughs> Zero tolerance. So, let's see what the Torah says about something like that. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 31. Chana, who's Chana? The mother of Shmuel, Samuel the prophet. Imo Shel Shmuel Anavi, she saw that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not listening to her prayer so far. Many years. How many years? How many years? Who knows? Nineteen and a half years. Every day from morning to night she cries. She cried so much that Eli thought she's drunk. You know how when, like, you're already dizzy from crying? She told him, I'm not drunk. I'm just begging Hashem to have a child. So what happened? Chana thought that Hashem is not listening to her. So she prayed to Hashem and she said to her, please see the misery of your servant. Amatcha. Amar Rabbi Elazar, in a Gemara. 
אמרה חנה לפני הקדוש ברוך הוא, חנה say to השם, ריבונו של עולם, master of universe, if you see my misery, good, and if you won't see, I am going to do something to force you to see. What? I'm gonna isolate myself with a man that is not my husband. Yeah, wait. My husband will be jealous. He will say, what is this? My wife is closing herself in a room with another man. He will take me to Bet HaMikdash. The Kohen will make me drink the water. Right? Amayim HaMeararim. They write the name of Hashem, 72 letters on a cloth like a mezuzah. They put it in a water. Let's see, have a glass of water, right? Which reminds me I got a drink. So you have a glass of water. They take the name of Hashem, they write it on a, on a mezuzah, they put it inside the ink, mixed with the water. The water gets a different color from the ink. Now she has to drink it. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Sheakon Yavid Dvaro. I wonder, does she make a bracha or no? And she drinks this water. <laughs> Maybe she's thirsty. It has ink in it. And sand. You're right, they take sand. They take sand also, you're right. So we got the answer. You don't make a bracha when you drink water mixed with sand and ink. So now, if she cheated her wound and her thighs explode, what does it have to do with the wound and the thighs? The organs when participate in a scene is covered from top and the bottom from those two places. So, so that's the clean language of the Torah to say that everything over there explodes and she dies. But I want to ask you a question. Do you know one stupid woman that will agree to go to the Kohen if she knows she did something wrong against her husband? Why would she agree? She said to him, you're insulting me. You're hurting my feelings. What kind of a husband you are? You don't trust me after all these years? You know what? If you don't trust me, I don't want to be your wife anymore. I'm going to call a lawyer, give me the get tomorrow. That will be the end of it. Better than to go and die. No? She would make it like it's his fault. The guilty people today, they always hate the cops. Cops is racist, the cop is violent, they find one bad cop and all cops are bad. Not all cops are bad, some of them are decent actually. <laughs> they want to do good things in the world. Yes, some are corrupted, yes, some are violent, yes, some are even murderers, we saw. But most of the police in the world are okay people, they, they try to break, they keep the law. Especially here in America, they're shaking now from fear. They fund the police, do they, they, they barely breathe. Especially in democratic places. So she's going to come to her husband and say, you know what? You insulted me. I don't want to be with you anymore. I don't care. You believe me, you don't believe me. You're going to hear from my lawyer. Come, ch kindalach, let's go to grandma. And that will be the end of it. I don't get it. Why would she agree to go? If she knows for sure she didn't cheat, she would run. Because after all, she's going to get a blessing from the coin and everybody will hear that she's not guilty. And she got the best blessing and her children will be the best tzaddikim. So she earned a lot from it. But if she knows she did it, why she would agree? On second thought, I think that many women who did not cheat would still not want to go from the embarrassment because the neighbors heard you heard what happened Moshe took his wife to the Kohen it will take two weeks until they get there and he doesn't shave her head he just opened the cover from here you see a proof that women must have hair they don't have to shave their head that's a proof from the Torah that women are not allowed to shave their hair because if women were supposed to be bald then you wouldn't have this verse in the Torah 
why would you have a verse that the coin open her hair? You see? You didn't like that proof. No? I'm saying you don't have to. If they could be strict on themselves and take it off. They have to have something there. Fine, fine. They don't have to shave, they're doing it so they don't have any title whatsoever. Today it's an obligation to shave the head by some places. See. She can enter the mikveh without it. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's exactly the point, Mr. Genius. You that you make a chumra that contradicts the law of the Torah. You, that's, you got it? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I know some people don't like to hear it. But we're searching for the truth. We're not politician. We don't have anything against anyone. We're just sticking to what's written. By the way, it's written in the Zohar that the beauty of a woman is her hair and she must be pretty for her husband. It's written that she has to be, woman must be pretty for her husband. It's an obligation. That's an obligation. If her husband doesn't like heavy, she cannot gain weight. If he doesn't like skinny, she cannot be skinny. If he likes her with this color of hair or I don't know, she must do all this. Because a part of her job in life is always to be pretty for her husband. Why? Because she saved him from sinning with other women. As the Gemara gave 50 different examples for it. By the greatest, holiest people in the world, they say, they ask, why your wife is so pretty and she comes to welcome you when you come from work? The answer was, to save me from looking at other women. So, yeah, the Gemara. So, uh, Abba Chilkiah, the grandson of Choni Amagel. The, the two rabbis from the bed in ask him, why your wife is uh, so pretty for you and she walks out when you come from work? I mean, well, what's the occasion? So he told them that I should not look with my eyes at other women. So if someone that speaks to Hashem and ten minutes later rain began, meaning it's the holiest person in the world, he said to you that if my wife will not be attractive to me, I'm going to look at others, then everybody else who claim otherwise is simply a liar. Because you're not even 1% of Abba Chilkiah and you will never be. So if you pretend to be the Baba Sali, we don't buy it. Let's finish with this, okay? So therefore, that's why, that's why it says that a person that is not married is incomplete. Because always his mind is in sins. Doesn't have a peace of mind. The Gemara compares it to someone who has bread in his basket and someone who doesn't. When you go to work, some people were poor. They take a basket with food. Those who have money, they take a basket with food and they have what to eat. Some people do not, cannot afford food. So they don't have a bread. So all day they worry about soon I'm going to starve with the sun here. I don't have water. I don't have bread. What, what's going to happen, right? So it's, it's the person that knows he has a nice sandwich waiting for 1, a. 1 p.m., he has a peace of mind. The person that has a wife, he knows he goes home, he has someone to love him and give him attention, he has a peace of mind from his problems. If he doesn't have it, he always, his mind is always on, you know, what could have been. That's the, na- the natural way of the world. Same thing when a person doesn't have money. So he always think, when will I finally have money? Person that do not have kids. When will I already have kids? Everyone is focused about what he doesn't have. It's in the way of the world. So she comes and say to Hashem, now I'm going to go to the Kohen, and he's going to make me drink the water, and when they see I did not cheat, he's going to be forced to give me a blessing, and once he gives me a blessing to have children, now you must do it for him, not for me. So I will circumvent, circumvent myself out of the picture. Meaning, you don't want to give me here, between me and you. You will give me through him. Genius, no? Man has a lot of chutzpah here. Come on. Genius, genius. But who say genius allowed to have chutzpah? Speak to Hashem here. Right? It's not the mayor of New York, de Blasio, with all due respect. <laughs> speak to Hashem. So now we have a few questions to ask. First, why Hannah say Elkanah Baali? We already know it's your husband. There's no extra word in the Tanakh. This is a divine language. Every extra word that it looks not relevant, you must investigate why it's there. So remember, we have this word Elkanah Baali, my husband. 
We already know who is Elkanah. So she could have said, I will, I will uh, be isolated with another man in front of my husband. She doesn't have to say Elkanah. She knows who her husband is. Okay. Second, Rashi says, Esater, im acherim. I will isolate myself with others, in plural. She did not say with other, with another person. With others, meaning two and up. Right? Others is at least two, plural. Why others? The whole idea of being jealous to your wife if she isolates with one individual, not with a group of men. So why she say with others? Ve'yachshedeni ba'ali, and my husband would suspect me. Why do we care who she's going to hide with? We got the point. Why does she have to say with whom? She just would say, Esater, and that's it. Third, Ve'yekanebi ve'yashkeni meisota. It will make, make me drink those water. How does Chana know she has permission to break a rule of the Torah? to test her husband, or to test Hashem, or to get something later on. Are you allowed to make a scene to benefit later on from it? No. Oh. So now the question is, Yichud. Who made the law of Yichud? David HaMelech and his Bet Din. 3,000 years ago. Meaning, a few years before. It was still fresh. Shmuel was the rabbi of David, right? And he nominated David. So that means Shmuel, when, when, when Shmuel was born, that means David was probably 40 at that time. No, Shmuel, Shmuel, no, David made the Isur Yichud. Huh? After Shaul. You're right, Shmuel nominated, Shmuel nominated David. David is after, David, David is after, you're right. Okay, so why, why, why it says, oh, Ichud, because she's Eshet Ish. Oh, there was Ichud, but not, not Ichud of a single woman. But David made the Ichud also on, on single women. Okay, all right. So there's nothing to do with David. It's just Ichud because she's an Eshet Ish. Eshet Ish, you always have Ichud. So, so now... Maybe that's why she's no. Maybe that's why she's not. Yes. Two yes. Women, two, with two women, yes. Okay. With two women, oh, yes. Woman with two men, no. Right. Men with two women, yes. So it says, after 19 and a half years of being barren, how can she take such responsibility that the name of Hashem will be erased for her trick? They are allowed to erase the name of Hashem. It's a very big sin. When you write mezuzah, how many letters do you have in a mezuzah? 713. Now imagine you write the whole mezuzah. Each letter, you have a feather, you dip it in a... What's the name of that feather? Quill. 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 You have a quill, you dip it in ink, sheen. Like this. Look, look how long it takes. That sheen. Now, mem, mem, mem. Now, ein, 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 that's one word. How long did it take? Ten seconds? Okay. So it would take you two and a half, three, three and a half hours, depending on how, how beautiful you write. So now, after he walked three hours, the last verse in the mezuzah, Ani, what, what's the last verse in the mezuzah? No, I am Shamoa, right? Uh, huh? No, the last word, the last, the last verse in Vayayim Shamoa, it's also the name of Hashem, right? So, you have the name of Hashem there. Yes, yeah, so now, imagine after he finished seven, uh, 650 letters, he, he he made a mistake now after the name of Hashem. He worked already three hours and the ink spilled. You put a little bit too much in the quill and he spilled and he touched the letter before. 
right? But the problem is you didn't realize and you continue and you wrote the name of God after it. Yud Kei Vav Kei. So, once you wrote the name of Hashem, you cannot fix the mistake. Because you have to shave all the letters going back to where you made a mistake, because the mezuzah must be in the right order, otherwise it doesn't have holiness. It's a big secret. When you write the Torah, the, 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 when you write the order of the parashiyot, it has to be kesidran. Shin, then mem, then ayin. If you wrote mem and then shin, pasul. It's not kosher. And you won't know it when you check the mezuzot. You don't know what the sofer did. You only see uh, the final products. You have to know who you get it from. So what happened? You cannot erase the name of Hashem now. So what happened? You have to bury that mezuzah. You work for three hours for nothing. Same thing tefillin. Sefer Torah, you can detach the part, take it, they fix it, you gum, you put it back. Why? Because it's not realistic. Because always you're going to find almost mistakes in a Sefer Torah when you check it. And therefore you will never be able to write a kosher Sefer Torah ever in your life. So therefore you're allowed to fix, when you find a mistake, you're allowed to fix. You cannot fix, you just replace that part. It's different parts, so together. So, Baruch Hashem, in my last trip to Israel, after 25 years, 24 years of selling tefillin and mezuzot, I finally reached the most perfect possible way of tefillin to get. Not just the parashiot, the best sofer that Chacham Ovadia Yosef himself chose his writing. Can't get better than that. His writing is like printing of a chumash. You know when you open the chumash? Like a print. Not enough that you have beautiful writing. It has to be Ben Torah. Therefore, Ben Torah, he writes very little. He doesn't write a lot, massive, commercial. He writes maximum, maximum one mezuzah a day. Parashiot of tefillin, maximum two a week. It's very difficult to get. But not only the, the parashiot, the batim. It's 100% handmade, and each one is supervised by itself. Because in all other factories, they pick up few and they check to see if you know what you're doing. But they don't check each individual. Over here is not a commercial place. They make one by one, it costs a lot more, one by one, and it's all 100% handmade. They don't use glue, no shortcut, everything by hand, and it's the most perfect finishing. Unbelievable, it's like the Rolls Royce of the Tefillin. <laughs> Combination of best sofer and the best batim and the stripes 100% handmade, all black on both sides. Ma maximum level that you can reach. I went with my friend, he's Av Bedin and a sofer, genius. He's Av Bedin in Bet Shemesh. We spent hours, we went, we checked, everything. To reach the highest level, Baruch Hashem. But you can see the blessing of this tefillin. I was able to get four. They were sold in one day as soon as I arrived. Now I got five more sold in one day. Wow. <laughs> Yesterday Benji told me, I'm going to replace my own. I told him, I'm sorry, I have very little. <laughs> That's not enough. <laughs> Why? When you see something perfect, right away everybody, it goes from word to mouth. I also want, I also want. The problem is that it's very few. Just like when you want to get Bet Yosef meat. If you come to a place and every day they have Bet Yosef, you know it's fake. That's not Bet Yosef. Because Bet Yosef, from every 20 cows, you have two, three that comes Bet Yosef. 10, 15 percent of the meat is Bet Yosef. Bet Yosef, I tell you what's the difference. When you slaughter a cow, the lung of the cow has to be complete, with no holes. If it has a hole in the lung, that's trefa. It's not kosher. So what do they do? They blow it, like a balloon. They close it and blow it. If it blows up, then it's kosher. If air comes out, it's not kosher. But what happened? When you get the lung of the cow, sometimes it's completely smooth, smooth like silk. And sometimes it has like those veins, it's called sirchot, veins on the outside of it. So what do they do, the Ashkenazim? They take their finger and they press on it slowly, gently, and smash it. 
and they make it smooth with their own finger. Meaning after they fix it with the finger, they, they check that nothing, there's no hole, and now it's smooth. It's kosher, glad kosher. By the Sfaradim, the Shulchan Aruch saying that's not good. It has to be naturally smooth, not with the help of your finger or your nail. That's called Bet Yosef. Why Bet Yosef? Because Rabbi Yosef Karo is the one who ruled that halacha. The Rama, Rabbi Moshe Iserlish, which was the head of the Ashkenazim at that time, 500 years ago, he has agaot, comments on the Shulchan Aruch according to the tradition of the European Jews. So he wrote over there, for us it's also good with a finger. So now, most cows don't have uh, na, uh, smooth, uh, uh, it cannot be that you buy in a supermarket in Brooklyn and every time you come, the whole sh always the shelves is full of Bet Yosef. Beloni. If you come, I need Bet Yosef, we're out of it. The next day, Bet Yosef, we're out of it. The third day, hey, we have a little left here. Oh, now there is a chance. You got it? Okay, why? Because... I wonder, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in, in one store, I don't want to say the name of the store, I saw one time in Ashkenazi ask the owner of the supermarket or the manager, do you have Bet Yosef? <laughs> he said, yeah, Bais Yosef. So he said, no, we have, but we keep it only for the Sfaradi customers. For you, it's good glad. If all the Ashkenazim would bat the Beis Yosef, we would lose the Sfaradi completely. They think about the business. But you don't have if you don't have. If you don't have, you don't have. What do you eat? You eat chicken? Chicken. Chicken. Eat hot dogs. <laughs> chicken hot dog. Huh? Look, you only have to eat meat if you have kosher meat. You cannot find kosher meat. You don't eat meat. Yes. So anyway, so why the owner of the supermarket thinks like this? If all the Ashkenazim buy the Bet Yosef that I have, I have hundreds of Sfaradim who comes every week to buy. They won't buy it from me at all. So I have to hide the Bet Yosef for the Sfaradim because the Ashkenazim, when they don't have Bet Yosef, they have what to buy. You understand? They do like their chief rabbi, and they do like their chief rabbi, and I sell double. Everyone is happy. Baruch Hashem. I think to myself, if I was Ashkenazi, I would only eat Bet Yosef. Why should I take a risk if there's an argument between two Chachamim? It's not that one say it's kosher, and one say it's kosher, but not as great. No, okay, at least the, one say it's kosher, one say it's totally not kosher. According to Bet Yosef, the glad kosher that the Ashkenazim eat is taref. That's the problem. The Ashkenazim have nothing to worry about because you have who to count on. But I'm saying, when you have machloket deoraita, I give you an example. One Ashkenazi paid 30 years ago $1,500 for a pair of tefillin. By the Ashkenazim, they kill you on the prices of tefillin. It goes to $4,000 now. You know, mezuzah or Ashkenazim can be $300 for a good one. 25. Now you come to me, you get the best tefillin in the world that you can find for under 1500 And that's 15 years later. <laughs> right? So, the idea... It's, be, it's very good business by then. You cannot get it. You ah, you can get, but I have to make it for you, Ashkenazi. That's it. But, so, one person came to Rav Eliashiv, and he said, Rav, can you look at this parashiot? Mm -hmm. I went to a sofer, and the sofer told me it's not kosher. I paid $1,500 for this tefillin. It's supposed to be the best. Rav Eliashiv looked, and he said, it's kosher bedieved. Meaning, after the fact, there is someone to count on that say that it's kosher, meaning you still fulfilled your mitzvah. So the guy say, ah, shkoyach rabbi, buri chashem. I was about to leave. Rav Eliashiv told him, ma? You want to live all your life bediyeved? 
with the doubt, with such an important mitzvah of tefillin, that's one of the three covenants that the Jewish nation made with God. Shabbat, Shin, Shabbat, Bet, Brit, Taf, Tefillin. Those are the only three commandments that the Torah used the word Ot. Ot means a sign. A sign that you are a kosher Jew. You have to have Shabbat in you. Shin, Shabbat. Shabbat starts with Shin. Bet, Brit Milah, circumcision. And three, Taf, Tefillin. Vaya Ot al Yadecha. Ot. Ot i b'ni u b'nechem, Shabbat. Vaya le'ot be'besar orlatchem. In the orla. Those are the three otot that we made with Hashem. Therefore, in order for you to be a kosher Jew, you need to have two witnesses every day to testify about you that you're kosher. So what happened? On Shabbat, you don't put filin. Shabbat is one of the covenant. And Brit Milah you have every day of your life. So you have two witnesses. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you don't keep Shabbat. So you have circumcision and tefillin. Therefore, a Jew that does not keep Shabbat, on Shabbat he doesn't have two witnesses. That is a Jew. A Jew that doesn't put tefillin all week, he never has any witness. A Jew that doesn't keep Shabbat and does not put tefillin, he does not have one day in his life a stamp that is a Jew. Do you know how many goyim, non-Jews, are sending me requests for tefillin and mezuzot? <laughs> Not only the ones that plan to convert. I just had a soldier from South Korea <laughs> ask me to buy mezuzah. He said, Rabbi, I'm a goy. He's in the army in South Korea. I looked at the address. What's this address? I didn't know. It's all kinds of numbers and letters. It's a base in South Korea. So, he asked me, if I'm a goy and I will buy that mezuzah, will it be protection on me just like it protects the Jews? Yes or no? It's going to protect the goy or no? Of course it will. Who can prove to me from the Gemara? Huh? No, he was a Rebbe, not Unculus, Rebbe gave mezuzah to the Roman Caesar. The Roman Caesar gave him a precious stone. Rebbe sent him a mezuzah. The Goy did not understand what mezuzah is. So he said to him, I'm giving you a precious stone as you the president of Israel and you're giving me a piece of paper. <laughs> So Rebbe told him, it's exactly the other way around. You gave me something that I have to always worry how to guard it. I gave you something that will guard you. So what do you see from here? It protects also the goyim. Are you allowed to sell a goyim mezuzah? Allowed. In one condition. That he will respect the holiness of it. If he's some antisemite who wants to burn it, you're not allowed to give him, obviously. Is a goy allowed to put filin? Allowed. Is a woman allowed to put filin? Allowed also, as long as she clean. After the mikveh, she can put filin. Can she put filin in public? No. Why? Because then she become reform. <laughs> they come to the to the Knesset with filin. She just came out of the hair stylist with her hair. Make my hair like this, that the tefillin will not be chatzitza. Chatzitza. <laughs> so, certain things a woman can do, but hiddenly. And she gets a reward for it. Even a tzitza she's allowed to wear. Every mitzvah a woman is allowed to keep. Time mitzvah. Timing mitzvah, she's not obligated to do, and if she doesn't do it, she doesn't get punished. But if she does, like the Ashkenaziot, they take lulav, and they even make bracha. They're not obligated to, to check lulav, but it's mitzvah, that's why they come and they make bracha. Or sit in a sukkah. A woman is not obligated, but she gets a reward for sitting in a sukkah. Basically, every mitzvah she does, almost everything, we have to go one by one to make sure that it's everything she's allowed to do. 
but she is not obligated to keep all the mitzvot. But almost everything she's allowed to do. But some mitzvot she's not allowed to do in public, like to walk with tzitzit, to put filin in public. She's not allowed, because this is the way of the reform, reshaim arurim, the wicked, cursed enemies of God, which call themselves reform Jews. Those are the one who does all this to get everybody angry and to make fun at the religion. So if a Jewish Orthodox woman will walk in a day with filin, that's going to look very bad. Like she's one of these Rishayim Reformim, it's Chilul Hashem, so she's not allowed. By the way, there are some famous women who used to walk with filin, like the, the granddaughter, the daughter of Rabbi Nutam, I think, the granddaughter of Rashi, they, they, they put filin. Some say Bruria. I never found a source for it. Bruria, the wife of Rabbi Meir, she was a genius in Torah. She argued with all the Chachamim. Some say she herself was putting tefillin. Let's, let's, let me give the women advice. I know they all got excited. Wow, I'm buying a tefillin tomorrow. Let's first be perfect on what you are obligated to do. Then we worry about the bonus. You know what it is? Like, oh, I can put tefillin. Moshe, prepare 1,500 bucks. What happened? I want tefillin. I want to eat another 100 bucks. I want it. Tzitzit Katan, prepared eighteen hundred dollars. <laughs> ah, she wants Rabbeinu Tam. Okay, another fifteen hundred bucks. Rabbeinu Tam. If she's married, she can. <laughs> Chabad, by the way, put Rabbeinu Tam even when they single. Sure, a lot of a lot of the singles Rabbeinu Tam, supposedly it's higher holiness, and uh, a man that is single should not put Rabbeinu Tam, like the Mekubalim say, until he's married. Once he's married, his wife can save him from gamma brit, from wasting seed. So as long as he's not married, it's not good to put. I don't know what Chabad is counting on, but just to let you what's the general opinion, why single men do not put Rabbeinu Tam almost everywhere. Via, oh, that's a very good point, because almost everyone has Brit Mila, but they, they, they're not keeping the Brit Mila. Of course, it has to keep the Brit Mila. If a person doesn't keep the Brit, it's Pogem Brit. So one of the covenant is broken, 100%. So let's move on. So is, uh, is Hannah allowed to make an experiment in the name of Hashem and erase, erase the, 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 the name of Hashem, the Shema Meforash yeah. that's written on a, on a clav? Just because she wants children? It's a horrible sin to erase the name of Hashem. The only reason Hashem allowed it is to make peace between a husband and wife. Meaning the husband cannot be with her because he's suspecting her. And the house is about to be broken. And Hashem said, I allow you to erase my holy name to make peace between a husband and wife. But no other reason. I'm not a, for writing tefillin. Well, I walk 10 hours. Hashem, have mercy. Start from the beginning. You're not allowed to erase my name. Tov? The next thing the Gemara asks. The Gemara says, If a woman is barren, and after the blessing of the Kohen, she becomes pregnant, good. There is another opinion in the Gemara that what it means is that until now when she was giving birth she was screaming and it's painful and now she won't have any pain. That's really the blessing. Not that you don't have kids and now you will have kids. So how is it going to help Hana according to that opinion? Why would Hana say such a thing to Hashem? That's a question on the rabbi. There's two opinions in the Gemara. One say you don't have kids. Now you drank from this water, the coin gave you a blessing. You're going to have kids, even though you were barren. The other opinion said, no, no, it's not about barren. It's about until now you have few kids and you suffer a lot giving birth. After the blessing of the Kohen, you won't have to suffer anymore giving birth. So according to that rabbi, how will he explain this Midrash? That Hannah said to Hashem, if you don't give me children, I'm going to go to the Kohen. It's not going to help her. She doesn't have kids. 
No, we're talking about suffering of delivery. If there's another opinion, if she has female, now she's going to have boys. Meaning until now she had only girls, finally she, the Kohen will give her bracha, she's going to have at least a boy. If she had midget kids, now she's going to have a tall one. If she has a black, she's going to have white. If she has white, she can have black. Meaning dark. Dark. Dark or blonde. Blonde or black hair. If she, uh, if she has one at a time, now she's going to have twins. Meaning there will be some kind of improvement. Not necessarily if you're barren, you're going to have kids. Even if you already had kids, something good has to happen to you for the embarrassment you got. רבי ישמעאל say, אם הייתה הכרה נפקדת, דברי רבי ישמעאל. אמר לרבי עקיבא, רבי עקיבא arguing with רבי ישמעאל. He say, אם כן, ילכו כל ההכרות ויסתתרו. רבי עקיבא say, you know what? In that case, all the barren women should pretend that they cheat. Hey, can you go with me into the room for five minutes? I have to tell you something. I don't want anyone to... She knows her husband is there. Lock the door. Chana! No answer. Hana! Hana! No answer. Then she comes up. <laughs> so now she's going to have a, ba a baby. Fantastic trick. Now what do you think? Let's think for a second. What is worse for women? that people will suspect her that she's an unfaithful woman and will talk about her. <coughs> Look at her, such a dirty woman. Look how she behaved, cheat on her husband. Or to get this embarrassment but to have a child finally after 20 years. Or better not to ruin your reputation as a modest woman and die without children. If an average woman of today will have the choice, which one of the two you think she would choose? get the embarrassment and get a child? Today it's not a question. Because first of all, there's no embarrassment. She's, gonna, she's about to get a TV show. <laughs> so she's gonna get, kill two birds with one stone. Not only she's gonna get a child, she will also be promoted. <laughs> because we live in such a rotten world that there's no more shame about anything. In case you don't understand what I'm talking about, next time, hopefully you never go there, but next time when you go to a party of your secular friends or family, pay attention how many men kiss the wife of the owner of the house when they come in. 50 guys kiss his wife. Hey, it's sick. You forgot to kiss her. <laughs> he gets angry. One guy did not touch you. No, no, I'm, I'm not into women. <laughs> Come on, man, it's only hello. I once went to a place. <laughs> I told the guy, oh, you're not embarrassed that your wife is going to sit down there in the beach. They live right by the beach. How oh, are you not embarrassed that your wife would sit on the beach with bikini in front of 10,000 psychos? Everyone goes, walk by, have dirty thoughts. How can you live with that? So what did he say? Everyone goes to the beach. Well, I'm the only one. She's the only one. I say, Let, let's describe a scenario that you have a birthday and your wife made you a birthday party. And she invited all your friends family, your brothers, your sisters, your in-laws, your, your parents, your, your, the whole, all your friends from work, 300 people in this beautiful apartment, and she comes out of the room with the cake and the candles, happy birthday to Itzik, and she came with bikini and high heels, and she came with your cake like this, with a bathing suit in front of your father, your brothers, your colleagues, your boss, the neighbors. Mazal <laughs> Tov Moshe! Should live to 120. If he's not dead already from a heart attack. <laughs> well, it happened to one guy, 
that's really happened. That's actually happened. In Israel, his wife, she called him, and he was upstairs, one foot already in the shower. No clothes. And he's alone in the apartment. She called him, she said to him, <laughs> listen, I left the soup on the fire on the stove. If you're not gonna shut the fire, it will all spill out. Can you go shut it? Oh, come on, I'm already in the shower. Please do me a favor, it will all spill. Tov. Now he's thinking, why, would I get dressed again now? I'm alone in the house. <laughs> he runs quietly. Now he goes, you know, you go downstairs, you have the light, and you make a U-turn to go towards the living room and the kitchen. As he walks down the stairs, turn the lights on. Surprise! 300 people with signs, happy birthday. All naked. <laughs> and people with pictures. <laughs> yeah. So you have to be modest even in hidden even in hidden rooms. So Rabbi Akiva say, based on what you say, all barren women will do that trick. Right? Ela melamed, and Rabbi Akiva say, from here we learn that if she was giving birth with the pain, now no pain. Short kids, now they told. This, that, all the things that I mentioned. The Gemara say, Mai im What does it mean, if ra'otire? The Torah speaks in the language of people. But the truth is Rabbi Akiva, conclusion, Rabbi Akiva say, that a woman that was giving birth with pain, if she was suspected and she went to the Kohen, she's going to give birth with no problems. Right? The Maharil Midiskin, he said, Hana was worried that this promise, Venikta Venizrea Zara, her reputation will be clean because she drank from the water and she didn't die. And now she will conceive, she become pregnant. Neemra rak im kach ayale maase. Meaning, it's only work if her husband warn her and tell her, I do not want you to isolate yourself with this specific man. Not if she did it and after the fact her husband saw it. If it's already happened once and now he told her, make sure it doesn't happen again. And now she did it again, that's when he can take her to the coin. Meaning she needs to get one warning. And obviously, she never did it, so her husband will never give her the warning, so he will not help her. So what did she do? So, what did she, you know, so, okay. But if a woman just does it for a trick, she's not going to get that promise. So Hana said to Hashem, if you meant in the Torah, that when people do it as a trick, it won't help them, right? Because they didn't do it f first time, now, the, now on the second time it works. You know, who knows what I did? Nobody knows me. I'm going to go to Yerushalayim, and they would assume already that I need to drink, and they'll give me to drink, and you will be forced to give me a child because what people would say otherwise. So one way or the other, you're going to have to give me a child. Because everybody will know I drank from the water and the blessing did not work on me. So the question is, if a woman did not cheat, will Hashem do it for her or not? Without a warning. She never got a warning. Her husband brought her without a warning. Nobody holds him. He brought her all the way. And they say to the coin, yes, I warned her many times. She doesn't listen. Okay, drink. Will she get or not? We have a rule, now I asked you before, but I, you still didn't give me an answer. Do you know one normal woman that will agree to go? If she knows she is about to die? No. What ego? Her reputation will be ruined for life. If she didn't do it. If she didn't do it, if she didn't do it. Either way. Either way, her reputation will be ruined. 
if she didn't do it, the fact that her husband suspected her, that's already a dead sentence to your reputation. The fact that a religious woman was taken from by her husband to the Kohen in Beta Mikdash, that's already a dead sentence. People, you see what happened? I told you she's not modest. Look, she's going out with the guys and she's talking to them without, in a room. That's already enough that nobody wants to marry her children. Now we're going to learn another rule. This law applies only when the husband himself is not a cheater. If he's a modest person, then the water will work. When he himself look at every woman around, then the water will not work. So then she has nothing to be afraid of. She said, ah, my husband is such a low life. I am no, no fear going to the coin. Wait. But if a person is guilty himself, the water will not check the woman. Right? Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lechana. Hashem said to Chana, even though you did not cheat, you're still not going to get a child. Why? And it won't be that I will not make my Torah a joke if I'm not giving you a child. You know why? Because people would say that your husband is also not righteous. You're only going to hurt yourself more. Yes. That, and that's why the water did not work. So Hana say, Hana say, I'm going to do it in front of my husband, Elkanah. Everybody knows who my husband is. It's the holiest person. He's a big tzaddik. One of 48 prophets. How many prophets the Jewish nation had? 48 men, 7 women. And the Goim, how many they had? 7. Muhammad is not one of them. <laughs> Why Muhammad is not one of them? Because Muhammad was 600 years after Hashem said there's no more prophecy in the world. Not by Jews and not by non-Jews. After the destruction of the second temple, we got a curse. What's the curse? The world will never have another prophet. Not Jews and not Goim. Therefore, everyone today who claims that he's a prophet is lying or imagining. Some people imagine. That's why there's not one prophecy in the Quran. Check the whole Quran. No prophecies. I spoke to a doctor from Saudi Arabia, a nice uh, educated Arab man. He started to listen to me on YouTube. <laughs> he told me, I don't know how, he told me in the first lecture I heard you, I taught you a Muslim American. <laughs> I say, how would you think I'm Muslim? He said, because everything you teach in your series, Psychology of the Mind, we learn in, uh, in Islam. A lot of the similar things about modesty. And in, in the beginning, I thought maybe you're more modern uh, Muslim or different than the Arabs here in Saudi Arabia, because there's different kinds of Muslim in Nigeria, in Africa. Not all Muslims are the same. Then I realized you're Jewish. I like you very much. So we became very good friends until I made the mistake of my life. I told him, can you point one prophecy in the Quran and send it to me? And he was an educated person in Quran, a doctor. From the embarrassment, he never came back. Because there's not one. No prophecy. Why Muhammad did not write prophecies? The same way I would not write any prophecies in my book, because I'm not a prophet. I don't know what's going to happen in a thousand years. Prophet only knows what God tells him to write. And he writes, and we will wait a thousand years and see if it happens, or a hundred years, whatever it is. Sometimes people think that being a prophet means you know everything, all the future, all the time. Baloney. You don't know anything. You only know specific things that God told you to write. That's it. But the rest of the days, somebody asks you, tell me, will I win the lottery or not? You're a prophet. No idea. It's nothing to do with God running the world. If you go to Israel and be in the temple, 
God told me yes. The Messiah would come and save you? God told me yes. You will inherit the Holy Land? Yes. This is what God told me. If you win the lottery, I have no clue. Would you live next week? I have no clue. Will you get married ever? I have no idea. Nothing. doesn't know anything. If somebody come and ask me what's going to happen with me in a month from now, will I pretend I know? No. I don't know. What are you asking me, madam? God? Only God knows. What are the reasons of why you got punished? They, they do it for Allah? When you ask another, why you got punished? A hundred percent from Allah. Ariya Kadosh could, was able to look at a person and tell him based on what hurts, what sins he committed. Five hundred years ago. You come to uh, Ariya Kadosh and say, my, my right kidney is sick. You know, something really happened. One Arab step a guy in Israel in his kidney. The knife went into the kidney. And when he went to, it happened, Rav Zamir Cohen said that in his lecture a few weeks ago. You actually know the guy. And he's a religious guy. And they took him to the hospital. And while they were operating on removing that kidney, they found out that that kidney had cancer in it, wow. which was about to spread to the rest of the body. So if that Arab did not stab him, he would be dead four or five months later. There was another case which I said about five years ago, which I read in the book of Rav Zilberstein about medicine, that one Israeli doctor by mistake removed the wrong kidney in the operation. He was supposed to remove one kidney and he removed the wrong one. And the wrong one that they removed they did a test on it, and they found cancer in it. Wow. And the patient sued the doctor, wow. suing for millions, for malpractice. And the doctor used the claim for his protection. I saved his life, and this ungrateful guy wants me to lose my license. Something like that. Who is right? The doctor or the patient? The patient is still right, but he's ungrateful. So, if the patient is right, how much the doctor has to pay him for saving his life? <laughs> so, what was the whole lawsuit for? He wants millions. <laughs> you know what you reminded me of an Israeli joke? Ata tzodek, aval en mish yatzdik otcha. You're right, but nobody here, here will justify you. <laughs> so why does it help me that I'm right? <laughs> he, so he wants money. Can he get money? It's a good, it's a hard question, by the way. It's a hard, very hard question. Do we go by the results, or we judge a person by the way to the results? You know how the liberal Jews today, every little word they say, I don't like him. <laughs> Why? He's judgmental. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Do you know one person in the history of the world that is not judgmental every hour of his life? One person. Include those lefties. You have to accept everyone. You have to love everyone. If a lefty walks in Tel Aviv and an Arab walks next to him with an angry face, he moves two steps to the side. <laughs> Judgmental! Why are you judging him? That's it. There's a lot of terrorism in these days. I was afraid he's going to stick a knife in my mouth. Why? It's not fair. <laughs> Judgmental. Only a fool will claim that you're not allowed to be judgmental. We all judge each other all the time. You judge your children, you judge your wife, you judge your husband, you judge the neighbor, you judge the rabbi. Right? If the rabbi buy a brand new Mercedes, right away you think, what kind of a rabbi is this? Drive such a car. Judgmental. If your rabbi come with a donkey, you're very proud. <laughs> I'll give my life for this rabbi. Look at him, he doesn't spend money on an, uh, even on a Toyota. Comes with a donkey. Look how he suffered for months. He comes with a donkey in the, in the heat. Look how he sweat. 
He left last Tuesday and he arrived, Baruch Hashem, to Monsi to give a shiur. Very good, I'm happy. The more he suffered, the more I like him. So that's judgmental. Everything is judgmental. A person get dressed in a certain way, you judge him already. If someone will come with a pink jacket, right away you think gay. <laughs> Happen to be is not gay, just a lunatic. The, ju the judgment was wrong, right? If he comes with a pink button and, and black, uh, a pink jacket and black flowers, <laughs> what would you think about him? Judgmental. If a person walks with a fancy watch, judgmental. Oh, this guy's probably a big shark. <laughs> Everything in life is judgmental. Everything. Huh? Now comes what the Torah demands. The Torah demands to be judgmental every second of your life. That's an obligation to be judgmental. You see a person walks naked in the street, make your children stay away from that person. You must be judgmental. Judge the weekend right away by what you see. You see a drug addict, make sure your kids don't come out of the room. You go on vacation in a place you thought it's kosher, but you see the people are not kosher there, leave the place right away. Why? Judge the people, they're all wicked there. Run away from there. Of course, what's the question? And what happens if you made a mistake in your judgment? You're not guilty. If you see a guy with 15 earrings and full of tattoos and a ponytail, and you judge him as a non-Shomer Shabbat, and somehow he's Shomer Shabbat. <laughs> it's possible, believe it or not. You are 100% not guilty. Why? Usually Shomer Shabbat don't dress like this and come with 15 earrings and tattoos on their body. Right? So I did nothing wrong. If you see a person is Mechalel Shabbat invites you to eat steak in his backyard and you did not go because you don't trust the meat that he buy, you are judgmental and you're one million percent right about it. You're going to get a reward for it. If you see a Goy Nazi Amaleki, he wants to come and visit you and you make an excuse that he shouldn't come, you're a hundred percent right. Why? Because he may come to burn you. He already burned your grandparents. He may try once again. Why? Everyone with their status. If you have a cousin that is a big thief because he needs money for his drugs and a wallet disappeared from your bedroom while he was there, you have to tell the police he's my suspect. That's the law. Nobody will say, how come you're so judgmental? The Torah did not say to be an idiot fool. The Torah say, you have to open up your eyes. Every person, you have to give him respect like he's the president of Israel, and at the same time like he's the top robber. I don't know who you are, I respect you as much as I can, but I have to watch my eye over you. Can we stay in your house until tomorrow while you're going? <laughs> That's what we just met. No, I'm sorry, we have to leave. You're so judgmental. You really suspect I'm gonna touch your stuff? Unfortunately, most people in the world steal, yes. <laughs> we don't know who you are. Right? You got the point? So all this fake liberalism, judgmental, judgmental, it's baloney. The Torah is judgmental. The rabbis must be judgmental. <laughs> they have rules to follow. So they see who is righteous and who is wicked. God is judgmental every second. Rambam writes, yesterday was hated, despicable, pushed away, and today is loved and friend, after he made repentance, he made tshuva. So yesterday Hashem judged you as a wicked person, doesn't want to look at your lousy face, and today is in love with you. What changed? You became Shomer Shabbat. You started to learn Torah. You stopped to steal. You stopped to be a racist. Your whole life changed. You changed your life. Now I love you. You go back to your evil way. Now I hate you again. It's all verses in the Torah. I did not make it up. Let's finish. I don't remember. We have to go back to that lecture and check what was the psak. It's not so simple.
Uh, believe me, it's a very complicated question. I'm sure there's arguments about it. All right, let's just finish the story here that we get the, the bottom of it. So if the man is not clean and is not faithful himself, right? It's not going to work on a woman. And Hannah said, no one will suspect that my husband is not an honest person. It's not going to be, it's not faithful. And the second that I have to ask, who will ever agree to isolate himself with a married woman, the, do- the wife of the chief rabbi of Israel? Where will she find that guy? That's why the Khatam Sofer says, it says, ומכל מקום נראה לי ראייה לרמב״ם מהאגדה שאמרה חנה I have a proof for what the Rambam say from what חנה say אם ראו, if you will see, good if you won't see, I'm going, if, meaning if you will give me, if you see that you have to give me a child, good and if not, I'm going to go and isolate myself in front of my husband Elkanah and everybody asks, who would agree to cooperate with such a thing? Chilul Hashem like this. Right? They, they say like this. According to the Rambam, she will go with two. She will isolate her with two guys. Even three. Right? Even though with Yichud she's allowed, she's allowed to be with two men or three. But her husband can still be jealous. Maybe she did one, something bad with one of them. Right? So according to the Rambam, a person can be zealous or jealous to his wife even if she was with more than one person. Even if they are kosher people. Even if they did not break the rules of Yichud. But the fact that she was there, he can also force her and take her to the Kohen to drink this water. The question is, what is the claim of Rabbi Akiva to Rabbi Ishmael that every woman will do it to get children? According to him, it will also happen. If a woman has a, 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 all, all uh, girls, she wants a boy, she will also do it. If she has midget and she wants a tall boy, she's going to do it also, right? If she has white, she wants dark. If she has dark, she wants white. So the question is, what's, what's the crush of Rabbi Akiva on Rabbi Ishmael, right? Aliba de Rabbi Ishmael, according to Rabbi Ishmael, Shamar, Imaita Akeret Nif Akara Nifkedet, if she was barren, now she's gonna become pregnant. By other women, if she already have kids, there's no fear that if she isolate herself to get the blessing, because as soon as her husband will find out, he said, What do I need this woman? Let me divorce her and find a different woman. Right? Because a, hus- a husband does not want a woman that behaves like a prostitute, that she does things like that. So immediately he would want to get rid of her. Right? And it's very unlikely that a woman, to avoid the pain of giving birth, will agree to ruin her reputation and her whole children's reputation just to avoid the pain. Let her take an epidural. <laughs> it's much easier. Right? That was the epidural of those days, right? So it's very unlikely that if she has short kids for, to have one tall one, she would agree to ruin her reputation. You have to remember, 2,000 years ago, you could not find one woman in the world that would dress not modest or behave in such a way. I put a, a, a video on my, on my Facebook page and on my, my WhatsApp groups, 1895 in Paris. All women dress with wedding gowns in the streets, all covered from head to toe. Umbrellas. It was not. It was not possible a woman would walk with short sleeves and everything open. It was not possible by the non-Jews. By the non-Jews, nobody dressed like this. Arab, American, British, French. Everybody was modest. I have a picture from South Carolina Beach in the year 1900. 1900, all women with gowns like this and, and a hat and, and a net cover the face and umbrella. If they want to go swim, they go into a spe- special room inside the water with a door. They swim, they get dressed and they come out. Nobody would see her swimming with a bathing suit. So 2,000 years ago, a woman will walk in a place being with a man. It would be the end of the world. Who would dare to do such thing? 
So to save some pain on giving birth or to have a child that looks better, she would agree? Nah, very unlikely. But if she doesn't have kids, she willing to take all the embarrassment in the world just to have a child. Why? Some people for them, it's, it's a must have. They cannot stop a second to suffer until they will have at least one child. That's why they adopt kids, they pay tons of money, they bring kids from Brazil. Ah, you don't know the headache they have to go through. Even though it's not their child, this kid has nothing to do with you, it's not your blood. No matter what, they must do it. Why? Because they don't have a rest. Today, today they get a dog, you're right. Yeah, a lot of single people in Manhattan, they have a dog. Or in uh, Montreal, or in Toronto, or in Tel Aviv, they get a dog. From the minute they get a dog, they really come down. No, no, it's a psychological thing. I've seen once a woman crying on her dog that choked in the elevator with his leash. I'll never forget that moment. It was Friday night in Upper West Side. I was invited for Shabbaton there. And uh, the leash got stuck in the elevator and it choked. I had to see how she was screaming. She could not stop for so long, maybe 20 minutes, screaming, pulling her hair off. That was a whole world, the dog. It's very sad that today we live in a world that many important people, lawyers, judges, mothers, doctors, teachers, pilots, all kinds of fancy schmancy celebrities came to the world to be a servant of a dog. <laughs> and they're not even aware of it. You walk an Arab, if a dog will touch his leg, it's the end of your life. If your dog will touch him. They go crazy when they see a dog. Why? They're right. The Torah says it's the filthiest animal from two million species. Where the Arab learn to hate pigs and dogs? From the Torah. Well, where did they get this? The Torah is 2,000 years before the Quran. They saw Hazir, they call it Hanzir. Hanzir. The original word is Hazir. They saw the Torah say that it's a filthy animal, very impure. They don't eat pork. They saw that Jews cannot stand dogs to touch them or to be in their home. They were taking care of the sheep. Dogs have uh, importance in life. In the old days, they guard the house, they, they shepherd the sheep. But to make the dog live in your living room? Not to talk about hugging him and kiss him and shemirachem. That's what happened to modern society. They came to the world to be servants of dogs. And they're proud of it. If you're still not convinced, go on YouTube and put women who marry their own dog. See what's going to come up. Animals marry animals, I agree. No, no, you have to see how a woman wear wedding gown. Today it's the happiest day of my life. I married the love of my life. Hi, Johnny, say something. How, how, would you marry her? How, yes. You have to see. They even have a ring. I, I just couldn't believe it. Was this a joke? Is it a comedy? What's going on here? Ah, top. They make bar, bar meat. That's reform Jews. Reform. Ay, ay, ay. I finish with one final story, which take a minute. One Jew from an Antwerp, he came to Rav Chaim Kreuzer. Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul say five people knows the whole Torah in the world. That was 30 years ago. 30, 35 years ago. Five people knows the whole Torah. Everything you talk about, the Torah is larger than the ocean. Everything you ask, they know. Who? The stipler, the father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. The father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. 
Rav Kreuzer from Belgium, from Antwerp. This is the one we're talking about, Rav Chaim Kreuzer. Rav Ovadia Yosef. Rav Chaim Kanievsky. And Rav Eliashi. Very good. They know the whole Torah. Everything. Chazonish already passed. If it was in the time of Chazonish, for sure he would include him also. But those were the ones who were alive at that time. He himself also knew the whole Torah, but of course he's not going to say it myself. <laughs> so this Rav, Rav Chaim Kreuzer, a Jew in Antwerp that lived a fancy life and lost all his money, he came to him for help. Rabbi, nobody knows about my business collapse. I need help. The rabbi went with his assistant to collect money for him, quietly. He shouldn't be embarrassed. They came to a very rich guy, and he said, how much are you collecting, rabbi? He said, $100,000. 30 years ago, it's like a million dollars today. He said, I'm willing to give 20% of the amount if you tell me what, who are you collecting for. He said, I cannot tell you. It's anonymous. He said, you know what? I'll give you 50%. Just tell me, please, who you're collecting for. No. Then he said, okay, you know what, Rabbi? Last chance. I'll give you everything. I'll give you the whole 100,000. Can you tell me who you're collecting for? The Rabbi said, I'm sorry, I can't. So before he left, the, he said to the Rabbi, can I talk to you alone in a room? He started to cry and confessed, I'm also broke. I lost everything I have. I don't have money for food. I'm willing to die as long as no one will find out about it. I'm so ashamed. But now when I saw the rabbi he knows how to keep a secret, I'm telling you my problem, because I would never dare to come to tell anyone about my problem. Can you also collect for me? Wow. What do you see, Rabotai? What do you see over here? Know me. In Megillat Ruth, she was multi-millionaire. She married the richest guy, Elimelech, a Jew, the leader of the community, an uncle of Boaz, the family. Rich, he went to Moab. Why? Business. Too many poor people knocking on his door. Help, 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 help. All day. I don't have what to eat. He went to Moab. His two sons left the yeshiva. Now they live in a place with all goyim. After a few years, they marry two non-Jewish women. They marry goyot. He died, and Naomi left alone as a widow. The two sons of Naomi also died. So she lost her husband and her two sons. And she's left now with two daughter-in-laws which are not even Jewish, Oropa and Ruth. So Naomi, when she came back with Ruth, everybody thought, oh, the rich woman is coming back to Israel. When then she found out she's basically homeless. She doesn't have what to eat, that this Goya Ruth is going to collect for her a few pieces of wheat and bring her money. So they say to her, where is all your wealth? Remember, there was no Facebook and news that you find out that the rich Jew died in Moab. So she told them there are two kinds of wealth in the world. Wealth that is blessed and wealth that is cursed. It's a curse for the person's life. Osher shamur leba'alav lera'ato will destroy your life. 98% of the people that became wealthy in the world, it destroyed them partially or fully. Hundreds of people who won United States lottery. They made an article, they, they, they interview each one of them. Two of them, it was blessing for their life. Everyone else, it said, destroyed his life got divorced, the children killed each other, fought, this, that, gambler. Look what's going on. People kill themselves over it. Many people, as soon as they become rich, they forget about God. I'm good. I have everything I have. 
Psychologically, they don't need any more to beg. Help, help, help. I have what I need. If the money makes you a sponsor, you sponsor lecture, you sponsor books, CDs, you organize seminars, you help the yeshivot, the best thing that could have happened to you. Now you're able to, to gain billions of mitzvot every month, thanks to your money. But how many people became such generous sponsor after they became rich? One guy was sued by a group of investors. Listen to this story. This guy is a friend of mine. He was sued by a group of investors that he recommended to them to invest money by someone. In the end, it was a Fonzi scam. Fonzi scam. Ponzi? Ponzi? Ponzi. Ponzi scam. Why in Hebrew they say Ponzi? I don't know. Top. Ponzi scam. The people sued. Scheme? Scheme. Scheme. Yeah. All right. So, Ponzi scheme. So, what's scam? Same thing. Same thing. So, what's the problem? Not what it's called. There are plenty of things to correct me for. When finally there's no reason, please. Give me a break. Anyway, so, <laughs> so this guy was sued by these people. All he did, he recommended a group of people to invest money by a guy that he himself invested money and the guy was paying him interest. Everything worked for him. Then the guy paid him back his money. And a while after, he told him, you want to invest money? Go to this guy, he's going to pay you such and such interest. They invested money by the guy, the FBI arrested him, and all the money went down the drain. They sued him in a court, liberal court. What responsibility he has? He did not act as a broke, nothing. He said, just tell him, go invest money with this guy. I invested by him and I made some money. And I went and invest and they lost. Who did they sue? They couldn't sue the other guy because he's in jail for life. So they sue him. You took us to this guy. The judge ruled for them that he has to pay them $10 million. Can you believe that? Because he, he recommended. This is the stupid law of America. I say to myself, it cannot be. It has to be a bribe here. It cannot be. He decided to appeal. What are the chances to win an appeal, statistically, 2%. One out of 50 cases in appeal, win. One to 50. And you need half a million dollars for lawyers. The lawyers are, they need to eat. They're very hungry. In America, they're very hungry. Not you. You, Baruch Hashem, a modest lawyer. But some lawyers, especially these big shots, they're very, very a very developed appetite to, to, to build an appeal which will take them probably a few hours of work, day or two maybe, half a million dollars. So it's a big gambling. He's already lost about 10, now he has to pay another half and may lose that also. He came to me. He said to me, if you pray for me, if I win the, the appeal, I'm going to give you more money than you, what you can imagine for what you do. I'm going to give seven million dollars for charity and a big piece of it I'm going to give you. I said, worth it to pray for him every day? Not only I pray for him, I put all yeshiva to pray for him. My yeshiva in Yerushalayim. So good for me, good for them. I took him to my cousin, which I very rarely ever do such thing, because my cousin every minute by him is calculated. I took him to my cousin, three people in years I took to my cousin, all three of them had a miracle. Couple that didn't have children for 14 years and tried everything. I took him, I gave them a blessing, a month later she was pregnant. A doctor friend of mine that I sometimes give lecture by his place, he was married for years, couldn't have children. 
I took him to my cousin, I sent him to my cousin with his wife, gave him a blessing, now they have three kids, the Sunday they had a Brit of another boy, three kids, and this guy, and he gave him a blessing that he won't have to pay them anything. No, to the, to the people who sued him. And he won the appeal. How much money he gave me? They're all smart people somehow. <laughs> he doesn't even remember his promise. But it's not only to me. Seven million lies he gave. You know Kinim? One, another one. Lies. I'm not wishing anyone bad and definitely not punishment. I'm just telling you the way people are. Over the years, hundreds of people told me, if I will be rich, I will give you so much. I say right now, I believe you 100% that that's your dream. But as soon as you will have the money in your hand, the Satan will grab your heart. Hey, you fool. Not so fast. It's not your fault. Now it will become a challenge. When you don't have the money, you can fantasize as much as you want about sponsoring Kirov. When you can have a million dollars in a deal, you have to give a hundred thousand minimum for tzedakah. Either way, the Satan will grab you by your neck. Hey, buy Chinese food for the shul party, single party. Chinese food, donuts for Hanukkah. <laughs> the Israeli army needs a caravan with billiard and ping pong. For that, yes. To save souls, <laughs> you're dreaming. So the only poor people, you're right, 100%. Some rich people donate, but the idea is that once it becomes practical, that's when the Yetzirah begin. And the proof for that is the Goim. Some Goim donate generously. Once they convert, psh, psh, almost all of them stop. Why? Until now, they didn't have so much Yetzirah. Do they get the merit for it, even though there's no Yetzirah? There's no someone finding them. Whatever they do, they get the merit. Everybody that does something good gets a huge reward. Nebuchadnezzar made three steps to respect God. He destroyed the temple. He killed 20 million people. He destroyed the world. He was the Hitler of those days, 2,600 years ago. He made three steps to respect Hashem in a letter. And Hashem gave him control for the whole world for seven years. Imagine the Gentiles that donate to me and thanks to their money I, made, I saved souls. In heaven, they will be in the greatest place that a Gentile can be. The Jew will get a bigger reward because he has more resistance. Same thing, a pretty woman that is very modest with very perfect body and look. And a very ugly, not good body woman that is also modest. Who is going to get a bigger reward? The one who has what to show. She has to fight a lot more about not be able to show her beauty to the world, right? A woman that is 90 years old with a cane. And a 17, 18 years old, a beautiful girl that walks to a place. The grandma is very modest and the beautiful girl is also very modest. Who gets a bigger reward? Obviously. So everything in life is like this. Someone who has desire to kill and he doesn't kill gets a huge reward. Someone who doesn't, he cannot kill a bug. He's definitely not a person. Some people, very easy for them to kill. They enjoy it. So if they want to kill and they don't kill, they get a much bigger reward. The one who's afraid to kill doesn't get any reward for not killing. Because he doesn't have a desire for it. Someone who does not have desire to steal it's against his nature. You can't touch something without permission. That's his nature, religious or not religious. And someone who has a huge desire to steal and he doesn't touch, who gets a bigger reward? The Gemara answered this question in one line. Lefum tsara agra. According to the effort you invest, that's how much your reward is going to be. The more effort you put, the more reward you put. It was hard in the beginning of becoming a Oh, now it's, it's a brilliant question. Very good question you ask. Person that in the beginning it was difficult, but then he get used to it. In the beginning it was very stingy. He doesn't give donation. So he start to fight. He put every day a dollar. Next week, two dollars. 
Next week, five dollars. Next week, ten dollars. Every week, slowly, slowly, after five years, he put every day a hundred dollar in a tzedakah box. But it's not difficult anymore. When he started, even a dollar was out. Now he's giving a hundred every day. It's not difficult because he got used to it. Does he get the reward like in the beginning when it was very difficult? Yeah. The answer is yes. Because he made it easy. That's the whole point. It's not easy. It's difficult still today. But he made it easy by fighting. You understand? That's why he get the reward just like it was in the beginning. Because his nature is stingy. He fixed his nature to become generous. That's why he gets a reward like a stingy person who gave a lot. You understand? Same thing a man that uh, is into women all the time. And he fought with himself and fought and fought and fought until it became easy. That's it. He's watching his eyes now. He got used to it. He doesn't look. He doesn't focus. Twenty years later, when he became so good now, he still gets a reward like in the first day when he was killing himself not to look. Why? Because he made it easy. That's the, the beautiful reward. You get it based on, I'm going into an impossible journey and I will make it. Once you made it, you get a reward like it's difficult, which is great. Bezrat Hashem, we'll see you next Tuesday. Uh, we asked the people that pray here today for Tuesday to do it in the back room. So I would like to start 8, 8.15, not later than that. Because it becomes already 11 o'clock. Baruch Adonai. לעולם אמן ואמן. רבי חנן